Association between the City of Ketchikan and the Cruise Line International Association for March 25th, 2024. Will the clerk please call the roll of the council members? Everyone. Yes, sir. Here. Sorry. <laughs> Pull everybody out. Cage. Here. Zingy. Flora. Here. Gas. Finnegan. Here. Kiefer. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands. Ketchikan City Council would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional first people of this land in Ketchikan, the Tongass Tlingit people. I thought we would first go around and uh, do some introductions. And so, so everyone knows who all is here. So we'll start with you. Yeah, we need to use that. Hello, uh, my name is Robert Marcus Turner with Carnival Corporation. Uh, it's loud up here. Helps us. Am I, am I good? You're fine. You're okay. Fine. <laughs> I was not, apparently. Um, uh, which also represents uh, Holland America, Princess, Carnival, Seaborn, and Cunard are the brands that we have that visit Catch Can, as well as our HAP operation, uh, Motor Coach Tour, Tour operation. So it's great to be here. Good afternoon, my name is Mark Flair, and I'm a member of the Ketchikan City Council. Hello, my name is Renee Lamoge-Reeve, and I am Vice President of Government and Community Relations for CLIA here in Alaska. I'm Judy Zingy, and I'm a member of the City Council. Hello, everyone. Uh, Lainey Downs with CLIA Alaska. Lalette Tisler, City Council. Delilah Walsh, City of Ketchikan Manager. Kim Stone, who's in Park. Laurie Boisa, Tourism Manager for the City of Ketchikan. Good afternoon, Ketchikan City Council. Good afternoon, General Engage City Council. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Sandy. We are with Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings, which includes Norwegian uh, Cruise Line vessels, Regent and Oceana. And I uh, look after government relations for the company and public affairs. Uh, Riley Gas on the City Council. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Preston Carnahan with Royal Caribbean Group, uh, which is Royal Caribbean International Celebrity Cruise Lines in Silver Sea. Uh, my colleague, Wendy Linskoog, will also be joining us, um, who's in charge of government relations, and I look after the business and commercial side. And we also have a couple of folks joining us uh, by screen. You want to introduce yourselves, please? Hi, I'm Larry Kay, Clea's General Counsel. Good to see everyone. Hi, Beth Thibodeau, Government and Community Relations for Disney Cruise Line. Hello, everybody. Jose Fernandez, uh, Board Strategy for Disney Cruise Line. Thank you. Okay, we will now open it up to public comments. Uh, we have a very hard, we have to close at 4 o'clock today so folks can make planes. So we're going to be limiting everyone to three minutes. Uh, I appreciate that. You can keep your comments fairly short. If you have more information for us, please uh, send us the information, send it to the clerk. We, we'll get it. We're not making decisions today, so we can look at the information in the future. But in the meantime, you know, keep your comments as brief as possible today. And first up, Mary Stevenson. Good afternoon, Mary Stevenson in tourism since uh, some of you were born. Um, I'm going to save my three minutes. I'm in hopes that I hear something new that generates a question and that the mayor turns it back to the audience for comments. So I hope to have uh, the ability to interact with the conversation today, make it a public vetting. Thank you much. We have no more time for that, so it's up to you. Chris Parks. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Chris Parks, general manager of Tongass Trading Company. Um, I've been a resident of Ketchikan now for almost 26 years. Um, and our business downtown is uh, 
if not the oldest, one of the oldest businesses in the state of Alaska since 1898. Um, uh, I just wanted to come and support the cruise industry in Ketchikan and just relate to everybody how important it is to our local business community. Uh, we weathered no cruise ships for two years during the during the um, shutdown here a couple of years ago during the COVID crisis. And we survived it better than we thought we would. But if it had been a long extended uh, term, I don't know if we would be here, you know, after 125 years. Um, you know, in our town, we have commercial fishing and we have tourism that are solely supported without government intervention or government support. Obviously, we have the Forest Service and the hospital and the shipyard. Those are all subsidized by, by government funds. The only ones, the only industries is really the cruise industry and the fishing industry that's somewhat you know, independent of that. And, and I'm involved in both of those. We sell commercial fishing gear and supplies. Uh, and we also have a souvenir division where you do souvenirs, but our local business is very much supported in, and, uh, and bolstered by the cruise industry in our town. And we just don't have a lot else. So I would hope that you guys in this room can get heads together and, and really make this a positive thing. I, I, I wince when I see things like the proposed limitations of cruise ships like on the 4th of July or that type of thing. I think most of our locals do support the cruise industry overall, and I think they know how important it is to our economy. I just want to relay from the business community how important it is. Um, we're open year round, and in the winter, there's nothing going on downtown. And the only reason why we stay open in the winter is one, to provide some goods for the locals, and two, to keep those employees employed. Um, we would make more money if we shut down for the winter. Um, and I have 50 over 50 employees year round, and we go to about 130 in the summer. So we're not the largest employer in town, uh, but it's very important that I think everybody understand that because there really is nothing else in our economy right now. There's no logging, there's no mining to speak of. Um, you know, we have fishing and fishing is, is up and down and it's actually gonna be struggling a little bit this year. The prices are down on the commercial fishing industry. So I think you all take that to heart about how important it is for our community. And thank you very much. Jim. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Council. And also, I want to say thank you to industry reps who showed up and are here for a collaborative communication and meeting because, um, you know, it's really hard whenever you hear about all the regional happenings in Southeast. I'm sure it's tough to come to tables like this with fear of unknown of how it's going to go or what rhetoric are you going to be met with. But I'm happily representing myself. I needed to say that. Um, I serve on the borough assembly, but I am representing myself and the businesses that I am in charge of. And I'm a product of tourism in Southeast and happily live in this community because of tourism. Um, Lori Boisa also, uh, happened to hire me in 2009 to work for Allen Rain Tours as a tour rep. And then I've worked myself up to be the vice president of the company and saw the land of opportunity. So my husband and I opened a business on Creek Street because of tourism. Um, I continue to see opportunity abound for locals. Um, the 18 year olds coming straight out of high school have work immediately. If they wanna work in the industry, we welcome them. They can quickly climb up the ladder here and have opportunities to create new businesses and be entrepreneurs because there is so much ability to do so and to spread out tourism across this island, not just our tiny city blocks. So I think it's a great conversation to be had here and I'm really looking forward to listening and leaning in and hearing how we can balance this out for the community residents who think that tourism doesn't impact their lives, but it very much does. Um, we have a lot of ways that we know rates are cheaper because we have this influx of people for six months that we can tolerate anything for six months. We tolerate the state road construction. We do all the windows of things that happen in six months in Alaska because of seasonality. So six months, we endure an influx of happy people who wanna see our backyard and experience it. And we get to highlight that for them and share the joy and give these bucket list experiences. I'm all for it. I've got 6 million other ideas for businesses in my head. I just don't have the money, but I see the opportunity all the time, but I'm very, very happy to see this here come together. So. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Michelle. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michelle O'Brien. I'm the executive director of the Greater Ketchikan Chamber of Commerce. And in the absence of timber, with the volatility of fishing, as we all know, is struggling right now, it's no secret that tourism is our number one economic driver. And your chamber is strongly in support of cruise and tourism as being that economic driver. 
I'm sure there's tons of ideas that people have about diversifying our economy, but the fact of the matter is it's a myth that you think that that might happen tomorrow or next year or maybe even five years from now. I will tell you that nine out of 10 of the businesses that we talk to, and we talk to them all daily, will say exactly what these folks have said before. The reason that they can stay open in the winter and serve our locals is due to a strong tourism economy. We are strongly in favor of this, and we would urge these two groups to come together to create a mutually beneficial relationship for a long and positive future for Catch Ken. Thank you. Hello, thanks for everybody coming here today and helping us with our tourism programs. I'm with Adventure Ketchikan Tours and the Thomas family. We have three tours that we run here in Ketchikan and we're 100% tourism and we run three fishing lodges, which I feel like is a kind of a tourism thing. I've been involved in tourism since the early 80s. I'm dating myself, but <laughs> but I think it's it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And with the fishing and the logging and everything else, I we don't have a lot of places to go right now. I agree with Michelle on that. You know, there just isn't a lot of places to go. So the 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 big push on um, economics is would be the tourism. So we're a hundred percent for it. Good afternoon. I don't know if I can adjust that, but okay, that was actually really easy. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Kara Tetley. I'm the executive director for the Ketchikan Visitors Bureau. And um, I was excited to hear about this meeting. And yesterday I was in a conversation and reminded that oftentimes we forget to say thank you um, in situations like this. And so that's all I'm gonna do is just shower all of you guys with gratitude here. So I wanted to say um, first to the city staff, um, thank you for seeing the importance of this meeting, excuse me, and working hard to prepare um, to make this successful, a successful conversation today. It isn't easy, but I uh, definitely appreciate the dedication to addressing these community needs. So thank you guys for getting up. Secondly, um, to the city council, thank you guys for being here as well. Um, you guys are elected into these roles by members of the community, and you've been listening to what the community is saying and recognizing that the concerns around the cruise tourism are valid and I appreciate you listening to all sides of this conversation and for approaching these concerns with the same thoughtfulness and integrity that I have come to recognize from the members of this community since I have been here in a little less than a year. Overall, the kindness and the warmth and friendliness, I think, of the Ketchikanites spreads. I've been going to some trade shows on behalf of Ketchikan this winter and I wish I would have taken the tip mark, tick marks of how many people came up to me and said how Ketchikan is their favorite community on their cruise stops. And it is because of the community members and the kindness that they receive and the warmth. And I just think that's really special because this is a great state with a lot of opportunities. And so I love hearing that Ketchikan is their favorite spot. And I know that there's a little bit of controversy around my coming from Juno, so I just want to throw out there. I never had that happen to me when I was doing this on behalf of Juno. So I just was, it was unexpected and it was very welcome. Um, and of course, to the cruise industry leaders, thank you for making this trip. Um, some of you guys are neighbors and fellow Alaskans and raise your families here. And I think that that shared knowledge is of the challenges and benefits of living in a state where so many communities rely on tourism but still want that wildness, I think that it's really helpful to be talking to our neighbors and having that same type of um, concern and compassion. So you're also, as the industry, your contributions have not only boosted our economy, but also brought joy and opportunity to our shores from supporting local businesses, fostering a vibrant tourism scene, charitable initiatives, and then the environmental stewardship that I have come to learn about. So I appreciate you coming here today to talk about also the other side of those effects. And so to all of you guys, 
Thank you for your willingness to engage in this dialogue to understand one another and work towards solutions that benefit everyone. I'm sorry, Kara, we have to stop you. That was my three minutes. Yep. Um, well, that was pretty much it. One sentence left. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Danielle, you also signed up to speak. Daniel Kelly. Yeah. Your name is next to this. I didn't think so. Danielle's the media, by the way. So. Yeah, let's just share, share a few thoughts here. Let's, let's see what we can do. Okay. Um, That's all who signed up and the audience who want to address us. Come on. Hi everyone, my name is Adriana Oliva Parks and I'm here on behalf of Cape Fox Corporation and its subsidiaries here in Ketchikan. So I do have a press statement um, just to share with you. Our business enterprises situated in the regions of the city of Ketchikan, city of Saxman and Ketchikan Gateway Borough have been engaged in the in a collaborative effort with CLIA and other members of the community to foster the growth and development of the local tourism industry. Our approach to partnership is characterized by close coordination and a shared commitment to providing our community members, shareholders, and other stakeholders with opportunities to secure gainful employment and contribute to the expansion of the tourism sector. We acknowledge the significance of demonstrating respect for the area's history, land, and the indigenous people who have inhabited the region, sorry, for generations. As an Alaska Native corporation, we endeavor to collaborate with partners who share our vision of integrating the magnificence of the past with innovative ideas of the present to thrive in a future that has cultural significance and goes beyond. Our business enterprises remain committed to the continued development of the tourism industry, and we are pleased to have the support of our partners and community members in achieving our shared objectives. And that's it. Thank you. Does anyone else want to address us? Come on. John Binkley from Ward Cove Dock Group, and I hadn't planned on speaking uh, this afternoon, but I was inspired by Kara with one word that she mentioned, which is gratitude. And Mr. Mayor, council members, thank you. Thank you for providing this forum, for really reaching out to the industry to have a discussion about how this community can move forward. And to the industry as well, express my gratitude and thanks. Uh, my family started in the tour business in 1950, up in Fairbanks with a small riverboat excursion. And I joined the company in 1953 and have been with them ever since, working in the family business. And I've seen firsthand, really, the tourism industry in the 1950s, the 1960s, the 70s, and as it started to grow in the 80s and 90s, and now 2000s, as cruise ships and more visitors started to come to Alaska. And I can testify about the thousands of people that have worked in our family business over, what, almost 80 years. And the, how meaningful that is in their growth as individuals. I think Jamie mentioned that opportunities for young people, high school students, college students, to start in this visitor industry where they learn to engage with adults, to present, uh, to really come into their own and to find themselves in the industry and then go on in our business. We've had uh, now mayors, legislators, uh, Lieutenant Governor Valerie Davidson, uh, many people who have gone on to do great things in Alaska, worked uh, in with our family in their younger formative years. So it's a, a great opportunity and I'm so appreciative of the industry and the opportunity has given my family and the thousands of people over the years that we've employed. So thank you to the council, to industry for pulling this together and seeing how we can move forward. There are challenges, no question about it, but I think collaboratively we can address those challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else want to address the assemblage today?
So I'm going to close persons to be heard. And we'll get on to our, our agenda. Um, first, I would like to make a few remarks, then we'll have, uh, we're going to make some remarks, and then we're going to get into it. Oh, he's, he's, wasn't sure exactly what he was doing. <laughs> he was rushing the podium. <laughs> so from the city of Ketchikan's standpoint, I think we would like to emphasize that there are basically three issues we wanted to discuss, at least get the conversation going today as we go forward. Uh, two short term, or not short term, two, two relatively short term and one, one longer term. And certainly those issues are, the, the first one of course is what we've talked about been talking about for several years now is the infamous capital and like the capital protection. For the, and we're at the stage now where I think we understand that it's going to be a fairly expensive process. It needs to be done. The docs need it, absolutely. Um, to be totally honest, we're kind of at the end of our financial ability to pay for that. And I guess we'd like to reach out to the industry and say, what are some of your ideas? You know, we're probably going to go to the state, we're going to the fence. But uh, well, our is $25 million. We will have a new number that's going to be up there. And we'll just have the ability to, to bond for that in the future. So we'd like to so let's bring that on the table and see what some of you like, because we'd like to work with the industry in a cooperative manner to figure out some way to resolve this, because we can't do this one on our own. The other um, you know, concern, I'll say in the short term, is uh, the promenade. As we all know, there were some um, issues with the promenade this last year. And it comes down to um, working with the industry once again to come up with some possible solutions for that going into the future. Um, from our standpoint, one of the issues with the promenade is the use of bow thrusters. And no, I'm not saying you can't use bow thrusters. We get that. We don't got the tugs. We understand that. But is there some way that we can work together to minimize the damage on the promenade and other port facilities going forward that works for both of us in the future? So that's, that's the second one. The third one is a little more long term, hopefully, we'll resolve it in a few months. Um, we've been talking now for a couple of years with the industry and also amongst ourselves. Um, can the city of Ketchikan come to an agreement with the cruise lines similar to the one Juno has? And hopefully, before we leave today, I, I want to get the, the general consensus that that's where we go. What are the next steps? Who meets with whom? Concerns who, who, who presents a proposal we, we need to, before we leave today, we need to have that going because I think that's the crucial one because that decides how we can use you know, passenger and vessel tax monies. And if we know what we can and you know what we can, and we're all good on that, we don't need to be having discussions around or, or talking about does this fit, does that fit, is, is this good or that bad. And from talking to my friends and engineers, they're good. For the most part, this is, is working on fine. We don't want to be in that situation, and we need to start that process now. And Ray. Thank you. I have some good news already. We have a shared goal. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mayor and City Council members, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today, Lori and Delilah, for putting this together in quite quick uh, fashion and getting us all around the table. Um, we're very much looking forward to a productive dialogue and advancing the priorities that we all support um, for the city, its residents, and the visitor experience. Um, as the 2024 season nears and looking at both the short and long term, we want to actively work together to advance our mutual priorities that we know exist and we're hoping to identify around this table today. For our part, the two things we're looking for is how would you as city council, as the mayor, as Ketchikan, how would you like to work with industry going forward? What can all parties do to positively shape our relationship and and make sure that it continues to be productive and that we are able to work together to advance the things that matter to us all? And secondly, we want to develop the same framework that you're discussing regarding the use of passenger fees. Um, you know, it, it may not look the same as Juno, and that's okay, but I think that you're right. Getting everybody around the table, having a, a framework in place that we live by, um, that exists long after everyone at this table is gone, I think is going to be the most productive way. And, you know, we, we want to have a process for discussing and moving those projects forward. So again, thank you. We are all happy to be here. Um, happy to have made it happen in a, quite a short period of time and get people from Canada and Seattle and California all at the table. Um, 
to have a great conversation today and our friends online. I don't want to forget team Disney. Thank you. Thank you. So we have eight bullet points here on the list that we all kind of have looked at. And uh, I guess what I want to do so that we can, we can get through all this in the reasonable, because we just basically you know, four o'clock is the drop dead point. So I'm going to try to hold each of these discussions to 15, 20 stops. So we make sure we get to all of them. So is that. So first up, we have CPV 101, use of CPV or workage fees to infrastructure and city infrastructure impacted by cruise tourists. Um, do you want to give us a bit of a CPV? So I think I will be calling on uh, CLIA's counsel, Larry Kay, who is online to be doing that. But yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. And hello, everyone. Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, thank you very much for having us and hosting us. Um, before I talk about the legal principles involved in CPD funding, I want to mention that we too are looking for the type of framework and collaboration that we've established in Juno. It didn't start out that way. Um, it was a contentious situation. We ended up going to litigation, but out of the litigation came a new resolved sense of purpose with regard to fees and the need for collaboration along the way, the need for discussing individual projects that may be in the gray area. And the cruise industry has a long history of working with ports around the country and around the world on funding for projects that may not be squarely within the uh, legal parameters, but are beneficial to the local community and the people that we serve, our, our passengers and their experience. So I hope you all keep that in mind as I discuss the legal restrictions on the use of fees. There are two sources of those restrictions. Um, the first one is the US Constitution itself. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 is referred to as the Tonnage Clause. And the Tonnage Clause simply says that a non-federal interest, such as a state or a municipality, cannot assess fees against vessels for the pleasure of coming to their port. The fees have to be related to a service that is provided to the vessel itself, to its marine operations. Um, so when we talk about things that benefit municipal infrastructure, um, transit uh, issues, uh, road repairs, beautification projects, those are generally funded out of uh, municipal general funding, not from passenger fees, it has to represent a service to a vessel, such as cathodic protection, um, security, fire protection, dockage maintenance and repair, cleaning, and so forth. Things that um, aid the use of the docks by the ships and that aid their marine operation. Um, the tonnage clause uh has been around for as long as the republic and has been repeatedly affirmed by the supreme court but in 2002 congress also passed a federal statute that codified all of the case law from the supreme court and the circuits on the use of, of passenger fees and um, it's found in title 33 of the united states code section 5b uh, and that's a statute that simply says, once again, fees levied against vessels engaged in interstate or foreign commerce have to be related to services provided solely to the vessels that pay the fees. They have to be proportionate to the costs actually incurred, and they have to place no more than a minimal burden on interstate commerce. Now, again, these rules were designed when the Republic was formed, um, and, and the federal statute grew out of all the case law over the years on this issue. But they're, they can be quite restrictive. Uh, and we have a history of working with ports on those restrictions and finding ways to agree to fund projects that, as I said before, benefit the community, benefit the cruise lines, help with passenger issues, even though they may not strictly be permissible under the under the legal restrictions I've outlined. 
uh, and, we, and we very much hope to have that type of collaboration with Catch a Can and with you all in the future and establish that framework that we have in Juno for collaborative, cooperative working uh, along side by side to strike the right balance between what's permissible and what's appropriate uh, to spend with the passenger fees. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions for? Did you have any follow up on that? Okay. I guess I'll take a second to ask the, the, the manager. She might, you know, part of this also was some of the city infrastructure issues of things that are indeed affected by the cruise industry. And so, if she wants to touch on that real briefly. Yep. Thank you. One of the questions that came up during council was. What about the impact to overall city infrastructure? So, in other words, to move the uh, tourists and cruise passengers throughout the city, there is an impact of increasing the, that population, whether it be in public restrooms or even sewer lines, uh, water lines, delivery of service. I know we'll talk about shore power later. That's another one that the, the entire city's infrastructure is impacted. But what's and perhaps this is something we come to in our agreement when we acknowledge these types of infrastructure items are allowable based on those uh, cruise passenger impacts. And I don't know if you can clarify for us or if that's a possibility. Is that a question to me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the types of expenses that you're describing fall squarely in the gray area, right? They're not, they're not um, definitively a service to the vessel, uh, but they're good for our passengers, they're good for the city. And those are the areas where under the framework in Juno, we sit down and discuss individual projects, costs and financing, how, how passenger fees might be used for some of those projects. But generally the law says that municipal infrastructure has to be funded by general municipal funds not by fed funds levied against the vessels that call there uh, because then that would be creating a situation where cruise passengers bear the expense of municipal infrastructure for every port they visit which is untenable uh, in the cruise industry there's only so much that we can tax our passengers and they too can challenge the use of fees they're the ones paying the fees so we always have to be mindful of class actions and claims by passengers that the fees are not being used for the types of purposes that are allowable under the Constitution. I know that's not a square and direct answer, but it's the most honest answer I can give. Before that, if I could ask anybody, if you have a question, if you could turn your name this way so the mayor can see if you've got an, in order to call on you, just makes it easier with such a, a big group. Thank you. Councilmember Gage. Yeah, before we get started, I'd like us to all agree that I understand that Hunnish Clause, but I'd like everybody in this room to understand that that is a 250 year old law. And I'd like to know if everyone's in agreement that when they made that ruling during the Republic, they were talking about vessels with materials, not vessels of thousands of people that impact our infrastructure. I think one of my biggest um, issues with this whole thing is the fact that when the tonnage law was written, they were bringing in materials and goods, not people, not millions of people. People impact our infrastructure. They use our toilets, they use our roads. There are 14,000 people on this island that this infrastructure was built for, it was not designed for 1.5 million people a day or a year. It's not designed for 2.5 million people. It's designed for a small community. Now, I do know that in the Caribbean that um, the, the, there is tonnage laws and information that those fees help support that commu those communities. And they're, I mean, they're considered a third world country. When I went to Jamaica, I paid $175 that went into their infrastructure. I had no problems with that. 
And so I'm just going to leave it at this is that I get the tonnage law, but I also think it's important that everyone in this room understand. We're not talking about goods coming into this community. We're talking about millions of people who impact our infrastructure, water, sewer, garbage. Roads half our roads are bridges. And this community should not have to the tap the backs of the community should not have to fork out money to pay for a bond to pay for a dock that the only thing you get to do is walk on it. Mr. Mayor, uh, panelists, I would like to mention perhaps as we come to an agreement under this framework that we also consider structuring of rate design in the city of Ketchikan. Is there something we can do to capture that revenue during the tourist season that impacts our infrastructure? I don't have that answer, so don't ask me what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> I don't have a solution yet. I'd have to ask somebody smarter than me. I have a few people in mind. Um, but perhaps it is something that we look into is, and I really appreciate hearing the comment that that is a gray area. And that's obviously something we can discuss and include in what we agree is a acceptable use of that gray area. Other part of the program for projects is you're obviously sitting on I'm sorry, so we want to leave it. Like I said. Um, we are actually um, 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 discussion at this point about the problem of our Catholic protection because we all kind of know what the issues are there. But it is something that we will be discussing with you guys. And it, once again, if you have any ideas of ways that we can, you know, get through this situation without our, our taxpayers with, you know, $25 or $30 million of additional bonds, we would love to hear it because we think we're kind of at the end of that. And, and then I'm not saying you have to pay for everything, but we, we think you might have some good ideas that we can use to move ahead on this, on both those. What we didn't talk about was upland development. Do you want to address that? I, I don't have any specific projects, but we do know that there's need in the upland in order to, uh, and, and we've got plenty of plants. We've done lots of studies. We've got plenty of upland plans. They're old and they're probably outdated and perhaps not even applicable in some areas, but we know we have challenges regarding our road development, um, staging areas, traffic management, safety and security. Uh, the council has been very clear that we want to ensure we've got ADA accessible uh, our entire city, not just the port, not just our city buildings, but that our entire city is accessible. That's one of the um, core values is accessibility with our council. So. What I'd like to hear from industry is if we if we talk in the sense of, of this framework, using that as our guiding thought, what are the options for us to move forward? What's the best way for us to approach these kind, kinds of items? Oh, no, I was, I was actually, I, I, was, <laughs> I, I saw eyes going back here, so I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Okay. No, th thank you, Mayor Kiefer. Uh, I, I just start by um, addressing the the broader framework of this meeting um, and say that um, you know the the first two items here for the, the promenade, the Catholic protection. Um, you know, I'm optimistic hearing that that's certainly something that um, we as an industry have expressed support for and finding ways to fund this type of work, um, you know, on the dock, on the, the promenade. And so I, I just wanted to express that at the beginning, it's a great starting point. And then, you know, with the third item being, you know, a framework, I think one thing that uh, I will express uh, coming from down south, as you say, from Seattle, um, <laughs> is that um, certainly, Ketchikan will have its own solution. I think we refer to a Juno solution because that's what's in existence today. Certainly, there will be a solution that is specific to Ketchikan and that meets the needs of Ketchikan. Um, you know, as, as I think and hear about the uplands development, you know, really what I, one of the things that I go towards is all of our guests 
are looking for great destination experiences. Catch Can provides that today. And so we're certainly interested, motivated to ensure that that is, is the experience that continues in Catch a Can um, through the projects that we take on with you. So thank you. Robert, I don't know if you could kind of walk us through the, what possible solutions there are. Um, I, I, I was going to ask, ask a question, maybe a little better sort of conversation around the cathodic protection. This is an example, right? Let's just assume the 25 million ish is the number you know, may change. Is that is, just for clarity? Are we, are we, is the question whether or not that that's an appropriate use of the fees and that we're. That's what we're asking here. Really, we, we know it's, let's say it is 25 million. If we wanted to get this all done in one fell swoop rather than over time, yeah. based on current revenues, are there solutions, as the mayor mentioned, we can't issue a $25 million bond today. Is there another uh, partnership or another source or another structure in which we could get those done a little faster? Yeah, have you, so the revenue you raised today off of the dockage, the head tax, the CPV, and the poor development fee. Um, I don't know how your, how your budgeting process works, but if you, if you sort of laid that out to say, well, here's how, what we have today and what can we get done, you know, maybe it's phased over two years or three years or something along those lines, or is that work that needs to happen once there's alignment on, yeah, that's an appropriate use of, of fees and we, we agree that's a top priority and move forward on it? We're comfortable that it's an appropriate use yeah. and that is exactly how we do our budgeting. We look at operations first. What does it take and what does it cost? You know, we look at our revenue lines. What does it take to operate? And then from there, we start to pick out our CIP. And so we know that our capital needs are greater than the current revenue structure. So we can't achieve everything. And that's with the entire city. We, if we had an extra 200 million dollars, we could get everything done. That's on our list, but that's not realistic and in any part of the city. And so that's sort of where this conversation is. If, if there's any other options, suggestions, partnerships that we could be exploring. It, it would take us far too long to raise that money, just not the CPV funds. And if we use them really, every, to do that project, they would have to be expensive on the docks. So that's what we're kind of saying. I, I think, I think this from my perspective, that's uh, that that was probably our green area because it's the dock. Yeah, nexus it's, it's the dock. The way. Right. Yeah. That said, though, there's almost no way we could just dump that all off on. We're going to use CPV funding for that because it would take too many years to come up with the money. Um, where uh, I, I, I'm saying the critical stage now. We're starting to get there. We've been talking about this for ten years. Yeah, also the Promodoc project, right? Which yes. does that have a, an estimate on it yet? And it's kind of the same question of just I assume the urgency on that is. Craig, I don't know. Do we have an estimate on the Promenade? <laughs> Not a little. Not a little. <laughs> So I, I would estimate just on the basics of what we know, it's going to be at least 5 million. And that's also a two part issue too, as, as well before, because we can't just repair it. And if there's something causing it to. Fall yeah. apart again, we can't just repair it and then 5 years later, say, we're going to repair it again. We need to figure out what the long term solution is. Yeah, that was my kind of my next follow up on that, because I think I've heard that it's. Pre presumed that it's from bow thrusters. I don't know if that's been. Studied, or there's any engineering behind that because I wouldn't want to fix it and then 10 years down the road be fixing it again. Fixing it again. And, and if we need to make operational changes, so there's been no direction to the fleets that I'm aware of to change our current operational practices there because there's been no, there's been no communication to them that, you know, this is an issue. So we, I think we can do some more work on that, but 
in the near term would say, well, let's first, what can we do now to st stop making the problem happen? And then what's a more permanent solution if that in fact is the, you know, the source of it. So. And you're absolutely correct it, on the report that we got back from our engineering firm when we initially inspected the promenade. It is assumed that the only way we could have lost that much overburden burden was because of the thrusters. That was just, but it's not a full engineering study. We didn't engage with that. It was enough to say, is the promenade safe for people to be walking on? And what do we need to do to make, make sure it's taken care of? Yeah. And so that's where, where we limited our study. And the assumption was that it was the thrusters. Um, but that is a, you're absolutely correct. And so. It's something we do have to fix and you're right. If we have to do a full engineering study to determine the source or the damage. If that would be the 1 next. But for the purpose of conversation. 5, 6 million is a good number for us to just have at least as a. A place to start it sounds like from based on what what with our uh, folks in the harbor have shared. So, yep. so 1, which I don't know if has been explored. One path is well, there's several. So there's there's federal grant money, um, and there's a lot of it available right now in ports. Um, I don't know if you've you know pursued any of those options. I know I've sent some things to you, <laughs> to yeah. know, but and and we have unfortunately most of the federal money is designated for shipping ports where goods are coming it's through, and, and yeah. if it and we're solely a cruise port, which is very unusual. I'm finding I didn't know that that we're solely a cruise port, and so. That has disqualified us for quite a bit. Um, I know we're, our team is working with other grant writers to explore other options and appreciate the share of that information. But that's yeah. sort of, we're in a weird um, exception because of that. Yeah, um, you, you're right. Uh, so our, our study of all the different programs out there is, is, is similar. A lot of them have a goods movement requirement, which doesn't really work for um, the cruise seg sector. PID. The PIDP program, which is a um, from from USDOT, the Merad, which is the maritime uh, division, uh, the PIDP uh, was modified to uh, not have the goods movement process, which then makes crews eligible. So we've helped some other ports apply for shore power projects, for example, under PIDP. So we Carnival has a, a consultant who's the former Merad administrator, the guy who used to give the Grants, um, and we've offered to other ports as well. Um, as catch can, we are happy to have him engage with your normally you have a grant writer or a team. And at least scrub all the available known opportunities uh, department of, uh, or the EPA has a couple of maritime programs. A lot of them have a nexus now to decarbonization. So that um, sometimes works works for shore power may not work for catheterization. <laughs> um, but um, anyways, just just as a resource, happy to um, to to utilize him. He's helping uh, community Juno right now with a with a grant application for their shore power and a few other uh, uh, communities. The other is um, state CPV funds. You know, you can apply for projects to the allocation that sits at the state. Um, I don't know if that path has been pursued, but this is certainly a worthy couple of projects that I think would be a compelling case because it's tied directly to this the industry and CPV versus some of the, the things that maybe come across their transom. Well we have applied in the past. We've gotten some we have not been successful on others. I mean yeah. the state tends to treat that as we've got this small pocket and all you want this and we're not gonna yeah. so it's kinda it's 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 a bit of a challenge. Plus we're also at the deal with the occasional state belief that non port communities are port communities. Yeah. Yes. Councilmember Gage. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was in 2016 that um, last study we did for the methodics to fix the the infrastructure of our docks was 45 million. That's not. I perfect. didn't pull it out. Wasn't it 40? Wasn't the study? I mean, the last one being 45, but uh, I thought it was 25, but I. Yeah. Once again, it's, it's at least six or seven years old too. So, yeah, yeah it's more than that. So triple it. So what else? <laughs> we're, 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 we've all seen all of our costs go through the roof through it since then. So, it's, and we won't we'll know for sure until we actually sit down. So, here. no one. The question I have though is um, because we're all like waiting for someone to answer. I guess um, my my question would be 
manager or whoever is how much does this community need to raise its pork, the head tax or whatever fee in order to raise enough money to secure our port system in order for these cruise lines to come in. If we were to raise it, I want, I just want this on the table that everybody understand that if we, if we were to raise it today, this is how much we would have to raise in order to meet the ability to keep that port viable. Because we've never as a city done a full actual rate study for the port. I don't have the answer today. We finished half the rate study, which includes comparing prices to other ports. But of course, that's just for information. It's not for uh, use by the city of Ketchikan. The next part is where PND has actually sent us their draft report of what are the critical needs of the port of Ketchikan. So that's your two part. Just like we talked about, in order to establish a revenue requirement and set those rates, you have to know what's operational costs, what is our CIP costs, and what is our depreciation costs. And what I mean by depreciation costs, and I'm, I apologize to the counselors, I know you guys all heard this during our rate setting work session, uh, but essentially that is, as our assets depreciate, are we raising enough revenue to replace those? So when they reach full depreciation or useful life, do we have enough in the capital funds to replace and continue that replacement? And then um, enough to meet our CIP needs as well as operational needs and interest costs and, and rising inflation and whatnot. So that's part of our, our rate study process. We do have a new rate engine coming up. We've finished programming out water. We've got to make some tweaks. We've almost done with electric. Um, the next one I believe is wastewater and then the port. So we've got them sort of in an order of how we're doing the rate engine. That will spit out to us, this is what your actual cost need is. Today, we don't, we don't have that projection because we've not done a proper revenue requirement study. But we are getting to that point, and we will be able to say demonstratively, this is the revenue requirement to meet all the infrastructure and operational needs of the Port of Ketchikan. But I don't have that number today because we've not ever done that. We've just said, this is our budget, this is how much money we need, let's raise rates. And so we, we really need to go into that process where we're looking at infrastructure replacement. I can't even tell you if it's sufficient. If today's um, revenues are sufficient, I can only tell you we're not using our reserves. So obviously it's not insufficient, but are we neglecting infrastructure? I, I can't give that answer yet. So we should come into our next section, which was refuge fees, use of funds. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go, 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 go. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. And before you jump to the next section, I actually wanted to, um, and if you're afraid of jumping around a bit, I wanted to fold one of the future bullet points into the current conversation because I think it's related in part because of something that Mr. Morgenstern said, and that's about the use of thrusters to leave the port. And you know, Mr. Morgenstern, you'd said that there'd been no real communication about whether there needs to be an operational change there. But because there's, in the absence of a study, there's an assumption that perhaps bow thrusters are part of the issues that we're seeing down there. If anybody could address the realities of an operational change that might diminish the amount of pressure we're seeing on the overburden along those pilings there. I just, I think it connects to this larger conversation about the physical condition of the port. So, Mayor, forgive me for jumping ahead. I just thought I'd fold it in here. Yeah, so I, I'll try to answer it. It's a great point. I mean, we'll presume that that's the cause. We should take action now, right? Because there's no harm not to take action. So, I think we talked about a little bit with Claude. How we can just get communication out to all the vessels, captains, et cetera. Um, here, it's perfect time. We're getting ready to ramp up the season. And um, what is in the art of the doable now in terms of, you know, getting off the dock? And is there anything we can do to mitigate um, the, the, the pressure from the thrusters? And if there's anything operational we can do right now, for sure. So that, that is a conversation we can have with CLIA outside of this meeting. Of yes, coming absolutely. up with those solutions and, and even if we implement something this season, as, as you mentioned, to, to give it a try and what are we seeing and whatever the results. That seems reasonable. Yeah. Yes, go up, yes. Just kind of listen to everybody and trying to, well, there's a lot of questions and I'm pretty simple fashion. <laughs> Before we move on to this issue, me, what it boils down to is, is it fair criticism to say, well, you guys have been charged with these fees over the last however many years. It's up to you to use that money to maintain and run your port. And if it's if you guys have all mine on the maintenance, that's on you. That's a fair criticism. I just think that uh, 
to answer some of the questions that come back and forth. Correct me if I'm wrong, but basically we are asking for some sort of monetary contribution outside of what we currently have. And the reason being that uh, it's just, we own the board, we're responsible for the, for the maintenance. But I think everyone acknowledges that you guys, in order to bring your ships here and do your business here, are also in need of, of that to be an operating, uh, properly maintained facility. And, and our concern is that we're getting to the point at which we don't address money that we don't have right now. Eventually, it's going to fail for all of the parties. So forgive me if I'm being too simplistic, but I think what we're really asking is. is I love it. <laughs> Telling us what grants are good to apply for, that'd be great, but at the end of the day, I think we're It's not. <laughs> but we also understand you guys are under constraints, too. Yeah, you know, so. Well, and, I, and I think the situation that we're in is n now that this now that the ask is on the table. I mean, that's not something that we are prepared to probably talk about today. I think knowing knowing that that's what's out there is something that we have to go back and discuss. And certainly, you know, as CLIA, we tend to be the convening party that brings all of our member lines together. But you know, those are questions that go to the highest levels of companies. Um, but appreciate the appreciate your frankness. No, at this point, we don't know. Even if we were asking for money, we're not sure, sure how much and where we're still in. And so that's, yeah. It's up. Yeah, that's what I, I was just going to add that, um, that our city manager here is keeping us in check. Delilah keeps saying that, you know, we really need that full study to be done and it hasn't been done. So I think that we're all looking for, you know, what's collected today. What do you, what, what that future is with inflation, with, um, you know, with the guest counts that we're going to see how, you know, when the season's going to run, how much we can collect. That's a really big exercise that she and, and the city that you're undertaking, but absolutely needs to be part of this conversation. So it's kind of like, we don't want to jump ahead too much with how much do we need? It all has to go in that pot. It all has to be analyzed. And um, I thank you for saying that you're doing that because I think that's what we need to move forward. And then we can come together in the fall. I don't know how long it's going to take you um, to get there. Is it? it is. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a huge study and we're, um, uh, uh, but, but it, it's absolutely necessary. And then once that exercise is done, it's really important to keep it refreshed too, so that we don't get into this. Uh, so, so we're not here again in, in three years and what changes have to be made have to be made. And, um, but we love that it, it, it also, once you put everything in, it should be a collaborative discussion to see what we can do. And if we can get behind you with the state, I know that Renee has some contacts at that level <laughs> and is willing to use them and, and kind of be a second voice and a second push for the industry because they do collect that money, uh, the, the state portion of the CPV funds. And um, this would be a very direct, uh, way of spending it. So we'd love to, Renee would love to engage with them, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank and, you, uh, help it all, Yeah, and help it along, help those conversations along. We'll go back to bat for you. Yep. So the next item actually was roughage fees, use of funds, don't group funds. We've kind of touched on that. Um, I think, do you want to touch on the line group on those other? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This this topic actually came up at our council meeting when we were considering are we charging enough in wharfage? And you know, in lieu of a study and doing the full uh, revenue analysis, revenue requirement analysis, we don't have the full answer yet. We will once we understand our capital and our, our depreciation and, and load that data. And I will tell you that the rate engine we're investing in, rather than hiring six consultants every year we invested in software so it does update every time we load our financial statements for the fiscal year all that data will automatically update um so actually robert or, or anybody else on your team if you'd like to explain and and for the the public's information the wharfage fees is what we call the head tax that's what the city collects per passenger and so that money is collected for the port fund and that's where it goes 
right now, I think it's $11 ahead when you come to the, the port of catch can. I think it's $8 if you're lightered out. I, I don't quote me on that. But um, Robert, I don't know if you or anybody else want to explain how you experience that throughout Alaska. Is it, we've, we've seen studies, um, our own rate study showing what it is in different areas. I think the in this discussion, it's important to note, I know it's Skagway that has the, the really large assessment, but it's a very limited largest assessment in order to deal with the landslide. So it's an agreement between the lines and the city to say, yes, we know we're gonna have a large head tax assessment, but we have a major infrastructure problem we need to deal with in a very short time period in order to make this all viable for everyone. So I don't know if you wanna expand a little bit on what it looks like in Alaska. I know you and I have had discussions about how expensive Alaska is per head, yeah. um, but it may not be something any of us really know because we only know what impacts catch can and that's really all that's important to me, but, <laughs> but it is a bigger discussion. Yeah, yeah, Alaska, when you add it up uh, across the board is, I think the most heavily taxed destination that we sail in anywhere. Um, and in part, that's because the CPV sits on top of all the local fees that are paid. Um, the home ports are also rather uh, expensive home ports as well. So the fees vary when you look across the world of ports um, in terms of the way that they're structured. And, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's an expensive destination. And again, it's the guest who pays that, right? It's the guest who pays that in their, what's called TF and PE, when they spend their money on their cruise, and um, which is what we talked about earlier with the, the conversation with Larry. Um, in the case of the Skagway example, yeah, the, you know, some of you may be aware there's a landslide issue there that is unfortunately located above a dock. Um, and, uh, and in order to, um, when there was a slide a couple summers ago that, that uh, actually hit the dock and, and so the sort of emergency mitigations need to be made in order to continue to be able to operate and albeit we're operating in a very modified fashion, nobody walks on that dock. Um, we came to agreement with the city on a uh, temporary fee that could be collected that could be used and directed towards uh, the remediation efforts there. Um, and so uh, that was not taken lightly um, because our experience has been anywhere in the world. When you add a fee, it never goes away. <laughs> so I think um, that's a consideration that's 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 needs to be just being real. Um, is um, there may be you know ideas around a temporary fee or a fee for a specific project, but they they would need to be time limited. Um, because otherwise they just become part of the backdrop of, of general fund fees. Is that something that would be a possibility or something we should reference when we come to this freight framework agreement? And what I mean by that, I think it was uh, Councilor Zangi asked, what can we do to ensure that our, our rates are dynamic, that we are responding to the impact to our infrastructure or the demand or something else like a landslide that could come up? Is there some sort of... Uh, agreement or formulation we can use uh, related to that revenue requirement. Well, please don't have any landslides. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, I think speaking for, I'm not speaking for everybody, just speaking for me and my corporation. I think when we have this conversation about fees and priorities on the waterfront, generally, if we understand how the money is going to be used and we agree it's a good idea, I think we can figure something out and it is, it is, uh, which means there needs to be a degree of openness in both directions, right? So we need to sit down and say, what's the budget? Where is all the fees that are being currently collected from the different revenue streams going to now? And I know you've got other operating expenses, all that stuff. So we're not naive about what it takes to run a port and all the services around it. But, but um, in order for us to feel, I think, the place where it makes sense and that we're comfortable and potentially time limited on something, then yeah, then I think it's doable. In the MOAs that we've had with Juno that are unrelated to fees specifically, but more around other operating issues, the reason why they worked is that we sat at the table and everybody held their nose and, you know, not everybody comes away happy. That means it's probably a good deal and compromise. And um, an important bit is there has to be a willingness to be transparent and open about, about um, hard things like, like fees and money. 
Alaska is a, an amazing destination. It's been a premium destination for years. Um, and uh, we like it to stay that way. And part of our dialogue with the communities is around making sure that we continue to be this is a place where the cruise lines want to send their best ships who get their highest paying customers that want to come to Alaska year after year. And um, this fits into that broader conversation as well. So I think uh, perhaps when we get through this, we have some parameters or definitions on the revenue requirement when we talk about infrastructure and, and capital improvement. Short sure, power. Yay. Yes, <laughs> we like it. <laughs> Actually, Robert, if it's you tell us why, you know, what, what that whole reasoning is because- Short power? And, and the reason I, I ask you to explain why is because to us, our priority is to provide power to the rate payers and our rate base that's here in Ketchikan today. So we want to meet the needs of our businesses, our citizens, our residents, um, whereas shore power could or could not do that. And so if you could speak to it a little bit, and I would like Jeremy to actually come up and, and speak to it. We'll give you a, a microphone. You can flip out with Lori in a minute, but uh, not flip out with Lori. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you can kind of explain your your why it's important, because yeah. I don't think people really understand why, and then yeah. Jeremy can expand a little bit more how it could. There are pros and cons related to shore power for us. Sure. So my speech on shore power is um, so. First of all, I, I think some of you don't know this, but the first ship plug-in for shore power in the world was in Juneau. I know we weren't supposed to mention Juneau. Sorry, Mayor. Sure. Uh, about the community up the up the way. Sure. So uh, somewhere over there. Yeah, somewhere over there. Um, it's very mature technology. It's been used for many years in uh, cargo as well. And we've got a number of ports here on the West Coast that are already enabled. We're looking at a few projects here in Alaska. The, the benefit of shore power is, first and foremost, is it reduces local emissions. So the benefit to the community is the area really is going to be that much cleaner because the power is coming from hopefully a a green power source, hydroelectric energy here in Ketchikan being a great example. And the ships can power down their engines and, and run on clean power where they're plugged in. There's also noise reductions. So ships rumble and you don't notice it until it's gone, but it's a lot quieter. Um, the third is that now, which has really become the primary reason why shore power is being kind of given a new life is because of the carbon reduction targets that maritime shipping, all maritime shipping have to meet under the IMO. And at present, there's not alternative fuel sources out there for ships to be able to meet those targets. So shore power is one strategy to help reduce the total carbon output from a ship because when it's plugged in again, it's not, it's not um, using fuel. So um, we see different shore power uh, structure or sort of uh, financial arrangements around the world. In Europe, under um, Fit for 55, all European ports are mandated to be shore power enabled by 2030. That's a government mandate, so it comes with uh, EU funding. And so we'll see really the entirety of Europe um, become electrified over the next several years. Uh, there's no such requirement in the U.S. at present. So at present, uh, it's really been at the port level whether or not um, shore power is something that the community sees as a priority. Um, the, the, the basic economics of shore power are there's obviously the capital up front, and that can, depending on the situation in a city, could be at the utility, it could be at the power source, it could be most often the biggest challenge is not, um, let me back up. If a community has power to sell, check the box. The biggest challenge typically is getting the power from the power station to the dock. And if it has to transit, for example, downtown city streets, which need to be torn up for conduit, the price tag starts to go up pretty quick. So part of the feasibility assessment needs to be, where's the power? Is there enough? How much is there? And um, how do we get it to the port? The actual equipment on the port, there is a footprint. There's some capital costs for that. That is not, the most expensive part of the project typically, um, and that is that equipment is generally 
Um, there's a couple years waiting for it, but it's generally a pretty straightforward install. There's several people and the, there are several operators in the world that can that can do that. The ships are all enabled for the most part, um, particularly ships that are deployed on the West Coast because you can't call in California if you don't plug in. So generally speaking, when ships get deployed in this market, they're already enabled for shore power. Um, the best practice is that the power is on a mobile cable unit so that no matter what ship comes in, wherever its plug is located, it can, it can plug in and actually use the shore power. There are ports that install it with a fixed jib. Ships come in and they can't actually plug in, which just is sort of tragic. Um, so that's really kind of in a nutshell. And I think what the question is for the community, besides you know the, the air emissions I mentioned earlier, is depending on whether you have power available to sell, or the utility has power to sell is does that help the the community's general power infrastructure right because it's another revenue source if you're selling power today that you're spilling over the dam ostensibly that's money that could be used to improve resiliency in a power maybe it comes back in the form of a ratepayer benefit of some sort that that is really between the utility and the city, not not between us. At the end of the day, we just plug in and, and pay pay for the power. Um, you're probably aware in Juno, ALP has a has sort of a rebate program where uh, the incremental power that they sold comes back to the ratepayer on their bill. Um, I think eight nine million bucks so far have come back to ratepayers as, as as part of a discount because um, it was a you know kind of a goodwill gesture when that project was done. So I think what the city would need to do and the utility and um, any of the other stakeholders is is really sit down and start doing the feasibility work on what would it take, how expensive would it make, and does the business case there? It's not always there. I'll just be honest. There are parts where it just doesn't financially make sense. And that's okay too. But I don't know that I don't know if Catch Ken knows that answer yet or not. Maybe maybe Jeremy's got a got a sense. Oh, do you have a mic? Oh, thank you. Oh. Thanks, Tracy. Jeremy Bynum, uh, Electric Division Manager for KPU. Uh, you you stole my thunder on most of these things on why you want to do uh, shore power or why it could be beneficial to the community. But ultimately, um, I'll take a step back and look and answer the first question, which was, is there available power? And the answer is currently yes, there is available power. And that is because our system as a whole, we spill, uh, I'm going to use the number 30 gigawatt hours of available power every year over the top of our dams on average. Uh, that number is a little bit higher when we go, go back to 1999, but we are seeing um, beneficial electrification in the region uh, through heating. The next thing is, so we have power available. The next thing is, is what is our largest source of sales when it comes to power from our utility? And in general, our li largest sale is in the form of heating, heating homes. And then it's our industrial loads, uh, whether it's the shipyard or whether it's our fish processors. Uh, the shipyard and fish processors, for the most part, are bringing on most of their load in the summertime. But our big peaks that we're seeing in our system happen in the wintertime. And so from our electric system perspective, without any additional investment, we are seeing, although we have enough available power, we don't have enough peaking of power. And so this is where trying to figure out a relationship that will allow us to have additional sales um, will help fund our ability to help, help uh, fund our ability to create additional peaking power for our communities because of beneficial electrification. One of those is shipshore electrification. And so we know that we have the available power. We know that we have the capability of doing the upland development to bring the peaking capacity. So KPU is currently working with our regional partners to answer that question of do we have peaking capacity? Can we deliver? And the answer is yes, we can. We have a plan to do that. And that plan is in place and going to likely happen whether shipshore happens or not because of our uh, needs for beneficial electrification. But we also want to maximize our resources in the, in the region. 
and to maintain stable electric rates for our, our uh, communities. And that's where the ship shore comes in. So some of the challenges that we face with ship shore is getting to the dock. In 2022, we evaluated what is the total cost of upland development plus the uh, uh, work that needs to happen at the dock and the infrastructure needed to connect to the ships. And that number in 2022 was about 32 million. I think in general, when we did it uh, presentation, we said between 30 and 40 is where we would need to be. And um, then we were exploring other opportunities for, is there federal money available grants? What does a partnership look like with the industry? I think in 2022, talking about the um, initiatives for reducing uh, footprint while trans or while while in movement wasn't a big uh, wasn't a big conversation at the time. At least when we were talking about it, it was more or less the benefits while in port. So I think maybe there's some movement in the right direction when we talk about uh, making sure that we can lower that overall carbon footprint for the ship itself. Um, so the challenges that we face as the utility is how is it going to be paid for? Typically, the utility will make sure that we're providing the infrastructure for what we need on our end for the speaking capacity um, and also our ability to provide power down our lines. Um, we have a plan to get down to, uh, in this case, the city docks. Uh, the question then is, is how is it going to be paid for once it actually gets down there? I think our total upland development uh, cost was about $4 million. Uh, when we were looking at KPU's costs, that was $2022. And that was also with our partnership with regional partners, with what they need to be able to bring into our system. And we're looking at how we can uh, fund those. Is that CEPA? Outside of this. Yes. Is that CEPA you're referring to? The, the regional partner? That is one of them. Yeah, it's okay. CEPA. CEPA is our primary partner right now for uh, dealing with their peaking concern uh, of beneficial electrification. So. At the end of the day, we, you know, we can sit down and we obviously then have conversations about what does an agreement look like? How do we structure it? But the big question is going to be, how do we pay for the actual shoreside, um, shoreside equipment? And that's not typically something that KPU would do. We typically, when we're working with the shipyard or fish processor or the NOAA dock that just came in, the Coast Guard, uh, we facilitate an ability to bring power to their facilities, but ultimately the, the facility owners pay for those. In this case, in this case, it would be either, um, you know, who's the ownership? We got to, those are all things that we just don't know. Who's going to own the infrastructure down on the docks? Is it going to be a port facility infrastructure? Is it going to be owned by the electric utility? Um, and then what do we structure the rates on? Uh, right now we have some of the lowest electric rates in Alaska. We have the lowest electric rate in Alaska. Let me rephrase that. We have the lowest electric rate in Alaska. Um, we want to be able to try to make sure that we stay low. And by having partnerships with shipshore electrification is one way that we do that. So I'm going to be able to answer any questions. Ultimately, uh, I will be providing out information for the council members that highlights a lot of the benefits and then some of the challenges. One other thing that was mentioned too was this uh, in Juneau, they provide back a little bit of funding for um, the residents. And one of the things that we hear here in this community is, is that if we do ship shore electrification, will we run out of power? Because in 2018, 19, we experienced a drought in the region. And our utilities spent about $4 million uh, bringing, in bringing in additional diesel assets into the region and paying for diesel fuel. So one of the components that would be an absolute necessity if we do shipshore electrification is, is that we do have to develop a dedicated uh, fund for rate stabilization to ensure that in the event that we run into low water conditions, drought, emergency, that we can uh, prevent that impact from hitting our ratepayers. And we do that specifically through a rate stabilization fund that would be subsidized through uh, industrial commercial um, sales, specifically shore, shore, shore power would be a big contributor of that. So be sure that we have been looking and thinking about this, not just at KPU, we've been collaborating with the city, we've talked a little bit with industry and our regional partners to say that this really does play 
into our lar larger need for electrification expansion to meet our needs in the winter time, having a reliable, stable source of power to sell in the summertime when we have our lowest loads uh, helps us build a model that creates sustainability for low cost, uh, reliable electric rates in the region. Thank you. I could just come back on a couple of points. The, the one that you mentioned about rate stabilization fund and what, what happens when we run short in a drought year or whatever, all of every short power agreement that I'm aware of, and there's, I don't know, 50 of them or whatever we have around the world are based on what's known as an interruptible power. So in the case of Juno, for example, if the lake level isn't there, um, we get turned off, right? So it's not, it's not, it's do no harm to the community. In places like California, where their peak power is in the summertime, it's not unusual for brownouts to happen. And again, all the industrial non-essential users, which this would be the case, get turned off. So, um, so I, I presume that you'd you'd have that same structure. Yeah, yeah I appreciate you bringing it. Absolutely, in any agreement that we would do as a power sales agreement, there would be the the, the no harm uh, to, to the utility to uh, interrupt yeah. for any and all reasons. Then the second key. Piece we talk, talked on the financial bid earlier about this sort of the capital side, right? Which can some of it be with utilities, some at the port. Um, your question about ownership. Typically, what we see around the world is that the utility owns up everything up until the property of the port and wherever the trans transformer facility may sit, a step down transformer may sit. And then the equipment on the dock that's used to interface with the ship is typically owned by the port. The benefit of that is um, that the port then can assess typically a recovery fee or something like that. The port would also typically who would arrange labor because you need labor to plug the ship in along with the ship's like electrotechnical, and that just gets um, charged to us as you know part of the overall sort of service fee. Um, the actual price of the power is the most important piece because. For ships to use it, it has to, you know, I talked about this outside in the hallway, but for the benefit of others, it has to be competitive with fuel. Otherwise, it won't be used. So, and the, the, the challenge I see oftentimes is the rate is the last thing that gets discussed in a project, which is backwards. It should be somewhere agreed. So, a lot of port or utilities will have an industrial rate structure or whatever. The sooner that gets sniffed out, it helps in the business case. Of whether or not it will get used because you don't want to spend all the money to do all the stuff and then have ships not plug in because it's not financially viable right um, here in alaska generally speaking power is less expensive and so um it's you know at franklin dock we plug in every every single call because it's you know it makes economic sense there's places in the world where um the penalty of of plugging in financially is is so high that unless it's made compulsory, you know, some operators won't just, they won't use it. So it's something to really bear in mind up front. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Ray, I think uh, the really, the big question for the council is, do we want shore power and do we want to pursue that? I know we've done somewhat of a high level study back. I know you and Mark worked on something around 2021, 20, 22, that it is feasible in Ketchikan. And Jeremy is absolutely right. We could do it today. The biggest questions are going to be on the community side is the footprint that Robert mentioned. What does that really look like on our docks? Because that's going to sit there whether or not we have cruise ships throughout the year. And, and what does it look like for us? The second is, and Robert alluded to this, is, is it fiscally feasible? So in other words, Jeremy and I were chatting is the uh, if we were to issue, let's say, a thirty-two million dollar revenue bond or a thirty dollar uh, thirty million dollar revenue bond, is the sales capacity or sales uh, what we're uh, uh, sorry projecting is that sufficient to pay that revenue bond without having to charge additional rates to our current rate payers? And that that's really the big question: Is it financially feasible for us to meet that debt obligation? Because we don't have cash and. The council, no, we don't have any cash anywhere. <laughs> we don't have any hidden caches of money and where we can make that investment. So we know that number one, we currently, I don't think we can sell enough to pay for that full debt issuance. So we know we're going to need either state or federal funding 
in order to uh, supplement that effort. So the first question is, you know, does our council want shore power because we're going to have to invest a huge amount of time and effort to come up with those models as well as those feasibility studies and even engineer. I think a feas feasibility study, you guys already did a lot of work yes. on that. So we know it's feasible. Yeah. We just don't have any engineering design estimates yet. We have some. Yeah, we have we have we have some just general design uh, laying, like I said, we, we have an idea about how we're going to be able to get power to the docks, what upland upgrades need to happen for that. We have some generalized idea of costs. That was April of 22. So I know that in the electric uh, industry right now that we've seen some really big increases uh, due to supply chain issues and then also the cost of raw materials. So that, that number is probably much bigger now. We have to really look at that again. But I think, you know, we talk about like a revenue bond on something like this. The big question is going to be is who has to carry the revenue bond? Uh, do they have the capacity to carry it even with re uh, guaranteed revenue? So we're looking at between three to four million dollars of annualized cost to carry that bond. And then uh, what kind of agreements do we actually come up with? So I think one of the first things that if we're going to be making a path forward in this space, we need to have a better understanding about what the obligation would be under an agreement. Who's going to connect with if it's available, you know, basically saying if power is available, you will then connect and what, what are the parameters for that? Um, and so all of those things, so we can kind of figure out the financial uh, payback on that. And then the other question is, 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 is the industry going to be a willing partner in helping participate in some of that forward cost? Uh, again, I know that uh, nothing is free. Uh, that whatever agreement comes into place would have to be at the benefit of both parties, uh, but there might be a, some benefit for uh, the industry to be uh, partaking in a part of that upfront cost for a potentially like a discount on rate kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So basically forward funding uh, part of your rate through that, that component. So we're not carrying, the port technically isn't going to carry all of the risk of, of making the investment, you know. Uh, yeah, I think it, this is all about coming up with a business case, right? And so um, you've got a good start on the feasibility piece, but that would certainly need to be sharpened up with today's cost and or projected costs, right? And um, as far as figuring out the related economics of it, I think it's hard, you know, we're here to partner with that. I mean, we do this in other ports. Um, I'll also mention that we are, for those of you who might be going to sea trade, I'm not sure if there's anybody uh, this year from Catch Can going down there. We're hosting a, so you want to electrify your dock uh, <laughs> seminar there. We've produced a, uh, a pamphlet as well that we've shared out with ports um, on the PIDP, the DIRA, all the different grant opportunities. So those are important in the business case as well, whether they're successful or not. Um, they also can help garner some state uh, support as well, particularly where there's a match. So I think it sounds like what we need to do, Jeremy, is just agree that, it, you know, depending on where the council sits on, this is a priority amongst catheterization and everything else is, is um, you know, let's work together on a business plan and figure out what must be true to make it make sense. Yeah. Renee and then Preston. I know that um, both Jeremy and Delilah are aware, but I would let others in the room know we are still talking about this. We're talking about shore power and the importance of shore power at a state level and a federal level as well. And I think as we look to um, the environmental regulations that are coming and our goals of, of being net zero carbon cruisers by 2050, all of these things come into play. And so as we look to future proof our itineraries in Alaska. That is part of why we're having these conversations at the state and federal level and with local communities like yourself. Preston? Yeah, thank you. Uh, as, as part of the, the business case and any work that's been done, it, what is the outcome for out of the four births? Do you know the capacity? Would it be for all four of them? The, the original concept was that we would have power available at all four. I, I have to go back and look at it. I believe the answer is yes, all four would have power. However, the capacity comes into question about what is the needed need for ship capacity. Uh, I originally, uh, they sent 
uh, industry had sent us kind of a guide about which ships are taking what kind of power. It really would depend on the blend at the dock. Uh, we would be able to build our capacity over time because we'd be getting some of those additional upland facilities available to us. I think that our overall capacity limit was about 20 megawatts, but it really is going to depend on what's happening in the industry as a whole, uh, in the community, fish processing, et cetera. So, yeah, and I would say we, we can also through our technical working group, make sure that you get that information for the ships of today and tomorrow to make sure that we're looking at that. Thank you. Yeah, I think I provided that info a couple of years ago and to Preston's point, all of our ships have gotten much more efficient in the last few years because again, with the carbon regulations we're under right now, the, the, the best thing we can do is just get, use less power. You use less power, you use less fuel, you have less emissions and no matter what fuel you use in the future, that'll also always be true. So there's been some real efficiency gains just in the last couple of years. I, th I think if I remember looking at some of that, some of the data said that you some of the ships were down as low as four megawatts and some ships had 12 megawatts of need. And so it really is going to just depend on which ships are in port and, and who's going to be taking on power. But we'd be absolutely um, on board with making sure we're maximizing that capability uh, when ships are in port. And I'll, I'll be honest, we uh, when we first talked about this as far as projects on the port, shore power is very, very low on the list. And I know that was something when uh, even Jeremy and I talking to council, like, should we pursue feasibility? Should we pursue more engineering? And it was kind of, ah, we've got so much need between cathodic protection and, and taking care of our peers and ins ensuring our docks are safe. Um, it was low on the list. And so if, if you could speak to why we should prioritize it, because that will be a council decision. Do you want us to spend the staff time, resources and investment on the port to pursue that project. And so I know it's a priority for you all as far as the carbon goals and whatnot, but what, what should our council know related to that, that effort? Like why, why is it a good investment? We talked a little bit about how the additional generation could possibly help our ratepayers and, and building out that new capacity if we needed it, but is there anything else you could add? Well, I think Renee made a point on her comment that um, worth repeating. I mean, part of why um, some ports are pursuing shore power is that they know that it will help ensure that ships will continue to call as we age through the uh, effort to get to net zero, right? Because if you can take five, six, seven, eight, ten hours off of carbon production in an itinerary and particularly in Alaska where you can do that in multiple ports, um, you can make a nice dent in your uh, carbon footprint. That's that's a consideration for some some ports. Um, I think generally though it's, uh, I would say, if, yeah, we'd love you to pursue this uh, feasibility study, but I don't know what the draw is on your internal resources and, and I think you'd have to, you know, evaluate that um, as a leadership group, but we're, all standing by to help as much as we can um, and, you know, whatever, when, in whatever way we can. We also have some technical folks who I think we may have shared, Jeremy, I don't remember if we sent Mike Watts your way, mm. um, but, you know, this guy's done just about every shore power install in North America, can tell you how to engineer it in the most efficient, cost-effective way, because if you go to a large consulting company, I can tell you right now, you're going to get an overbuilt, overpriced system. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that that's really an answer for me, Delilah, other than um, I can't speak to your resources. Um, we're happy to help if we can. And I appreciate that because, you know, ultimately we'll take our capital direction from council and, and they need to be well informed on those decisions and investments. Oh, sorry, Wendy. I was just going to quickly add on sometimes momentum is your friend and right now we've got um, some good support at the state level. You've got Senator Stedman, who's really on fire. I don't think I've, I've, I hear him talk about Southeast and cruising when he doesn't add in shore power and his efforts on electrification. Same with the governor. Um, you've got, uh, as Robert covered, a, a lot of grants that may be cobbled together. So if you look at the current environment, that may elevate priority just a little bit, at, at least to take it to the next step in, in the business planning aspect. 
Um, I also, I'm not sure what's going on with DOT in the past. I've heard that they had some, you know, if they're in doing road work and there's some funding to decarbonize uh, associated with federal dollars. So I don't know if they're part of your partnership group, Jeremy, or not. But anyway, just some thoughts on the politics of it all. Yeah, and I just, um, I guess I just want to add further to everybody's comments and the, the alignment that we all have that it's important. It's an important piece of the future. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you as you start to look at and put this plan together that it's always a priority. Um, so, although that the US, like Robert had said, doesn't have as many strict guidelines as Europe has and what we're, what we're seeing through the, through the EU Parliament that's, um, you know, a daily dialogue on how to get to their fit for 55 and their 2050 goals. Um, but we operate all globally. So, uh, when you look at what we put out on a global level in our uh, sustainability reports, our ESG reports, we have committed as a company, as a global company to get to net zero by 2050. And that includes all itineraries. And as we start to go in that direction, where we all have interim targets that we've set, so we wouldn't want to see um, us not reaching some type of target in Alaska in general, and have it um, either, you know, competing for um, for itineraries that are more um, fuel efficient or or meet our guidelines that we need to yeah. get to. Uh, we do have the green corridor. Uh, project that's on the horizon that we're doing to try and create the first green corridor. Uh, I'm not sure who's going to who's going to win if that's in North America or now if that's in the world, because I'm hearing lots of shipping corridors, um, green corridors now over over in, in, in the EU as well. But um, as part of that plan, the more that we can elevate that and create a dialogue around it, there could be some funding coming that way as well. Not only for um, not only for biofuels, but also for um, for plugging in. So, I just want to say to encourage it to always be part of your conversation and always have it on the horizon as somewhere that you want to get. But I also want to emphasize finally too that what Robert said is our our ships are getting more and more fuel efficient because we view that as the best way to get to our to get to our carbon intensity uh, and our our GHG goals is to just plane reduce what we're using on the ship and whether that be through heat recovery systems, um, new coatings on the on the outside of our hull to uh, use less energy, changing our lighting, doing uh, programming um, in the entertainment area that doesn't require um, as as much draw on our electrical power. That's our that's our first goal is just reduce that power. And as we reduce that power and then we have new fuels and then we have shore power that all gets us to our goals. So we just encourage the discussion to continue and collaborate with us on it. Councilmember Gage and Councilmember Kessler. Uh, in all fairness, I think that um, electrifying our port is great. However, I also don't like putting the cart before the, before the horse when we don't have a viable port system. So if the infrastructure is not solid and we have electrification sitting there that no longer can be used because the ships can't come in, what's the point? Then we can't fund putting that in. So we can't pay it back. So, if, I mean, I, I think rewind because at the end of the day, yeah, it's all nice and would be beautiful and I'm all about green. Um, and I don't like to be Debbie Downer, but we had this conversation multiple times is that first come, what needs to happen first is our port needs to be viable uh, structure wise. And that should be the conversation is how do we get there before we start talking about electrification. Tongas Avenue will be getting torn up by DOT. Um, love to know what um, DOT is doing for other communities. In the past 40 years, I've been here my entire life, and Ketchikan has always been the last one to get anything. And most of us know that half our sidewalks are not ADA compliant. 
Some of them were built in the 50s. They were as old as my mother. So, um, I, you know, it would just be nice if we, I mean, to bring it back to the conversation that, you know, before we start talking about electrification, get off the, get off the actual subject is that we really have to have a port that's going to be, that's going to be able to hold the, the boats. Because if you can't, if you can't dock, you can't buy a shore power, and then we have a $45 million bill that we can't fund or pay for. I don't think anyone disagrees with you, council. I mean, but, 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 it, but then again, it's we still, I think what we're asking is that it be part of the conversation. And that's what we're here today to talk about is all of the different things that we're facing as an industry and a community in our partnership. So don't disagree with you, but definitely would, I think all we were trying to express is that we'd like it to still continue to be part of the conversation. It's more just like so I uh, initially heard about this shore power when I first became a council member, and uh, and I, I was all excited about it, and uh, not too much excitement at the time from anyone else, but it is starting to at least gain some feasibility. So uh, I, I agree we should keep it on the table. Um, obviously, we have other bigger issues that we have to take care of that are more press, pressing. Um, and, and we can do things in the meantime to maybe look forward to shore power uh, when the street is torn up and maybe uh, put some things in looking forward to something like that. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has any ideas about because there are these funding opportunities right now, and, and we just don't have the money for the match. We just don't have it. Does anybody have any ideas about how long um, this is going to be a thing? Um, and so that the opportunity doesn't get passed up. for the grant opportunities that are out there right now. I don't know how long they're going to last. And if anybody has any inklings about future opportunities. Yeah, so I would add through some work in some other ports. There's currently a defined amount of federal funding. Is that what you're referring to for the grant match? Um, and yeah, there's certain percentages and formulas um, for the communities, I would say certainly one of the pre requirements is to have the feasibility done and to have a pretty well defined budget to make yourself competitive. Um, you know, large ports, commercial ports, cargo ports are also going after, you know, these funds pretty aggressively with, as we mentioned, grant writers. And so I think for the city to go after that, um, certainly be aggressive in the timing of what we're getting to um, those bills were passed, you know, a couple of years ago um, that laid this out. And as we know today, the situation, it's, it's a fixed amount of money. And so whether that comes up again, um, I think it's, is anyone's guess, but certainly it's, it's a pot of money that's going to be exhausted um, through this application process. Any idea of how long? It might go before it's exhausted. Any inside information? <laughs> Other than it's through the EPA now, um, you know, they're, they're currently reviewing applications. And I would say, you know, a lot of these, as we've discussed, are 50 plus million dollar projects. And so that doesn't include a lot of recipients, kind of based on what we see today. Councilmember Kessler. So, Part of, part of your question was talking about the match money. And when we looked at this in 2022, we know that when we're going out asking for federal money for electrification, that there was a significant match component to that. Um, from our local perspective, we were looking at leveraging current, already planned current needs to meet our, our uh, beneficial electrification that's happening to us as part of that match. And I believe when we were putting that together that there was a component where we were looking to say, this is where we wanted to have a partnership 
with the industry to help with that match component. But I believe that the majority of the four to six million dollars of upland development was going to be something that we were paying for, not just from KPU's perspective, but with our regional partners to create the pie that that, that part of the pie that was considered match. So it's not just get coming to the table with cash. It could be coming to the table with any other uh, part of that project development that was considered part of the match money. And so we did have that as part of our assessment in the 2022 presentation. And we'd be outside of here happy to share that presentation and go over that presentation again to talk a little bit about how do we leverage our current needs, our ongoing activities, and then requesting the partnership with the, the industry to say, here's how we come up with that match money. I know for some of the federal programs, they go through a reauthorization process each year. So PIDP got reauthorized. That's the big, that's the big one that most people are going after in short power. I don't know how, how, if that's going to happen again in the future, I would imagine, this is just me guessing, don't write it down, <laughs> that given the long-term objective to decarbonize basically everything, that there will be ongoing programs, et cetera. I think that the challenge is always maritime is one of those segments of the industry that oftentimes is not in people's minds when they're crafting legislation. And it's sort of an unseen um, industry. So we're trying to really be aggressive with what's available on the table now, just because we know historically maritime sometimes isn't, isn't as top of mind as air because everybody flies and other transportation sectors. So. I wanted to um, address something that was asked a few moments ago. And that was, how does this benefit the city of Ketchikan? We understand how this is benefiting the industry, but when we take a step back and say, how does this benefit Ketchikan? There's a couple of things that we know for certain. Number one, we currently have lost energy over our spillways, and that lost energy directly costs our utility in the form of a payment to a regional partner for lost energy. That's happening now. That cost us um, that cost us between a quarter million and three quarters of a million dollars a year uh, a year for that lost revenue that's uh, happening in the system. The other thing that we know that's happening is is that we see beneficial electrification happening, and our community is pushing hard to uh, from the community's perspective. They're pushing hard to come up with cheaper alternatives to heat their homes. So we're seeing a big explosion of not just um, direct electric heating, but of uh, heat pumps and those sorts of things happening in our community. And that's causing something on our utility right now that we don't have control over, and that's forced demand. So when we have forced demand, that means that we have to be able to provide the power. We have to, or we're having rolling uh, brownouts or blackouts in our community. We're seeing that load growth happen pretty rapidly. And so there's things that we're currently doing with our, one of our regional partners, SEPA, and that's adding a, um, there's been presentations on this of where they're adding a third unit TIE. They're talking about adding an additional substation out at Ward Cove so that we can meet that, that forced demand. One of the things that helps us in the utility make those things happen is having an interruptible power sales agreement with, an, with a partner like the cruise lines here with shipshore electrification. We could enter into, as an example, a power sales agreement with them right now without having anything built yet. It might take five, ten years to actually develop out that um, infrastructure at the docks. But with that power sales agreement, we then can leverage it to invest in third unit TIE for SEPA or other regional partners that want to do things. It helps us back our revenue bonds when we need to do uh, emergency diesels for Bailey or uh, upgrading our substations. And so it gives us a lot of leverage from a financial perspective 
that when we enter into these interruptible power sales agreements, that we have those as backing for our ability to do all of the other uh, electrical benefit uh, uh, upgrades that we need to benefit our community as an overall uh, strategy. So there are direct benefits to the city of Ketchikan and our re residents, not just here in, in Ketchikan, but with our other regional partners in Petersburg and Wrangell, by having these kinds of agreements with, uh, with the city of Ketchikan's ports and uh, the regional park or the uh, cruise line partners. Let's move forward. Okay. Um, in general, can you tell us how long does it take to connect and disconnect from shore power? We're, we're looking at relatively short port calls. I'd also like to know if you have any information on the net benefit to the reduction in air pollution and idling versus a cold or a semi cold start, which is going to be a high emission event. So, how long would an engine have to be at rest to offset? the peak emissions that's going to happen when you restart that engine. Sailor, you want to take it? <laughs> uh, I think in, in two parts. So the first, the first part about how long does it take to get online? Um, so we would say it's a phased approach. It doesn't just come on and we go up on the load over about an hour. And then it's similar on the way back down. So you could say two hours coming in total, an hour coming up and an hour coming down. As far as the, the technical aspects of those emissions, I would point towards our technical working group to get back to you on that. I don't think that's something that we can provide detail today. Thank you. I, I pointed to him, but I'm still answer the question too. So, sorry, um, we do actually measure it. Um, as well, I wish it was like NASCAR, you know, they chip pull in and boom, plug it right in. But as Preston said, it we use in our modeling an hour, but it's usually about 40 minutes on each side, but it depends a lot on what's going on on the key side. So most places we plug in are home ports. You also have storing going on. You have multiple getting ways, um, you know, 30, 40 trucks visiting the ship, fueling all that. So that tends to impede it when we do it in a place like Juno or other transit port, a protocol like catch can, it's usually faster. Um, the emissions we can, we can, as Preston said, we can get it. And there are some ports now and Seattle's one of them who actually track that and it's publicly available information as well on their website because they use that in their overall um, air shed emissions factor um, for the, for the year. Thank you. Yep. I guess just to follow up on um, I'm not sure quite going to address. Um, but is, is, is there a point where it's not, I mean, granted, we, we're talking about shorter port calls here. You take an hour off one, take an hour off the other, three, four hours in the middle. Is that still worth it to go through this? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, part of the feasibility is um, the, the way we look at it, and others may do it differently, is we look at the hours in port and we take away that, you know, plug in, unplug time. And it's the you know total hours in port across our uh, operating theater right for a year and get the, what the annualized hours. So the connected hours is really the the denominator you want to use in the math to to figure it out. And so that's part of the really part of the the rate case. So um, for a really short port call, yeah, probably probably questionable whether or not it makes sense. The um, the other question I don't think we really quite answered is the the, the burst and startup right with these diesel, diesel engines. Yeah, so that's something that we've uh, technically we've been working on because part of the benefit of shore power as well is that it reduces visible emissions. So you can be plugged in all day, then you go to start up your engine and you puff black smoke, and you still get the complaint. <laughs> you don't get the credit for the eight hours, right? You get the complaint for the puff of smoke. So um, if you know diesel engines, they you know how they start. Yeah, yeah. So I know you do. <laughs> so um, that is a technical piece of working on where they're trying to meter it up and have a have a less of a, a burst on load. Uh, there's also been some experimentation with some of the lines around using batteries in port, and that's part of the benefit as well. Is if the ship has a battery, it can be used in the maneuvering 
proportion when, you know, the total load on the ship is relatively low, low proportion as a way to maneuver in port without any, any visible emissions or, or other emissions. So it's a not return to crack. So next item document is more touch on, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, really. Go ahead, go ahead. I just had a quick question. One, well, two, you asked the one, so I'll skip that one. But to backtrack to you, Mr. Morgan Stern, from a point you made earlier about, I just was curious, you mentioned that you guys have partnered with other ports around the world and you used the term partnering uh, to, with the shore power situation. Could you just elaborate on what that partnership looks like in general, financially, and in other ways? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So, um, the first several shore power installs we did, we, um, in Juneau and in uh, the Port of Seattle, we actually own the equipment in the Port of Seattle. Um, we, we invested in it directly in order to make that happen. Uh, it's not our preferred way to go, not because we don't want to spend the money, but because on the ongoing basis, we don't want to be responsible for capital in somebody else's port. Um, uh, but we've, we have taken that route before. Um, obviously, the stuff we've talked about here before in terms of assisting on the financial business case, um, lobbying for, for uh, federal or other match fund sources, those kinds of things. Um, technical assistance, so not only the grant writer I mentioned, but we work with um, one of our uh, short power installers to be the technical partner. Um, that is a project savings to a community, right? Instead of having to go out and go through an RFP and hire somebody who's, who's, who's a short power installer, we'll, we generally try to bring that person to the table. It saves everybody money and time. Um, so, yeah, so it's just kind of a variety there. And then again, depending on the economic situation with, a, with an install and whatever the larger business case, the sort of supporting fee um, to help either do capital cost recovery or ongoing operational support. Those are all literally different in every part, but is, is part of the discussion. And so there's some different arrangements there, but that's another component area where we can come to agreement. Hopefully that helps. So moving on to our next item, we really touched on some of the use of short, use of thrusters in port boilers in port. What I heard before, I just want to confirm that I'm, I'm correct here. Um, we, of course, in the city standpoint, are continuing to, to, to do our, our engineering to determine what it's going to cost to obviously. And so we'll, we'll have, have a number for you guys at some point, probably in, in the not too distant future. But it also sounds as though you get, the, the industry itself is looking at, at operational things it could possibly do to ameliorate that going forward, at least in at least short term. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mayor Kiefer. Uh, I would say for myself, and I think for the group, this has been a recent um, announcement that, and, and although I think for the city and some others here, it's been uh, something that you guys have discussed for a while, um, but certainly we're, we're open to understanding more about the, the past impacts, and then certainly we will do whatever we can operationally in the interim to, to minimize that impact. Um, towards the, the pilings and towards that area. And I think any additional information that you can share from the city's perspective, you know, engineering reports, et cetera, we can pass that information along to our technical teams um, and be able to give you a better idea. You never want to ask the government relations person anything technical. That's my rule. I was just going to say that. <laughs> No, I, kidding. I do have it as one of my follow ups that after this meeting, that's our staff responsibility to get with you and share yep. that information. Let's start talking about operational changes. Yep. Yeah, there's a subcommittee of CLIA called Ops and Tech, and you've probably heard references to that before, but it's the actual mariners and people who do know what they're talking about when it comes to this stuff. And so that's a good, a good project for them to work with you guys on. In fact, we're actually working, we'll be meeting at Sea Trade. And I was just thinking, you know, we, we helped to develop that agenda, and this is something that we can at least flag that will be coming from the city. Yeah, I, I think it's not. I mean, we've had suspicions over the past several years about issues, but it wasn't until we saw what actually happened with the promenade that it's like, well, okay, something's causing this and that. So I, I don't think it's, it's not necessarily been our, you know, our plate a lot long either. We're still trying to figure it out too. Okay. 
passenger movement assessment in person meetings. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. That one I'm actually going to turn over to Lori because she's had some discussions with uh, Jose and, and his team. So one of the biggest comments that comes up from our own citizens as well as businesses and, and pedestrians and drivers is that management of the traffic flow. I know we even talked about it during our dock vendor placement of, you know, I, I watch it from my window and I scare myself a little bit when I see those big throngs of people moving in our crosswalks. And so um, we know that we need to do a better job of passenger flow. We don't know what the solutions are. We don't know if it's street closures, directional changes, uh, traffic flow changes, staging areas. There are lots of options. I'm not a traffic engineer. We don't have a traffic engineer. Uh, Mark Hilson has a great uh, comment about traffic engineers that they may not necessarily be uh, highly qualified in Ketchikan. So we may not have a, a Alaskan traffic engineer. Um, but Lori, if you want to take that on, I know you and Jose have had more conversations on that. So you're, yes, thanks, Delilah, and thank you, Mayor. We have been having some initial discussions. I met with Jose Fernandez, who's on the screen up there, and we've been having conversations about his engineering, his Imagineers, as they're called, coming and taking a look at how people move through our community. I think that none of us could argue with the fact that Disney has it down pat. They understand how to move people, how to distribute people, how to create wayfinding so that if you've ever been at any of their facilities, you know where you are, where you're going, and how to get back to where you need to get with no questions asked. Also, if you've ever been in one of the parks on a day that's been, quote, busy, you still don't feel like you're in a really crowded park. It's all in the way that they engineer the people movement. And so we've been discussing this. Um, Jose, I'm going to turn it over to you in a sec. And I have created a shared folder that I've been downloading information about maps and just all different kinds of information about the downtown core area so that his engineers can have information before they come. And I believe that they may even have chosen a date that they're going to be coming to visit us this summer. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jose. Thanks, Laurie. And, and just before I jump in, just want to say thank you to everybody for taking the time to have this dialogue, have this conversation on all these topics. Um, we periodically will deploy our industrial engineers uh, to various ports to just help us really, you know, from a cruise line perspective, a Disney cruise line perspective, take a look at things from a guest experience standpoint to understand guest flow, traffic, safety, signage, um, you know, placement of whether it's, you know, kiosks or vendors, shore excursion, dispatch, what have you. And what we generally do is we try to take a look at it from a destination perspective, not just a Disney cruise line perspective, because usually the work that our industrial engineers do and what they identify will benefit our operation, but generally it has sort of a, a waterfall effect in helping the entire area. And by and large, particularly in, in the destinations that we visit as ports of call, such as Ketchikan, there's a lot of partnership that we need from the community to help maybe you know put some signs up or help us in working with uh, the partners, you know, private partners to maybe shift where their kiosks are or, you know, rearrange where the buses may park, et cetera. So this is something that we've been uh, really excited to do since we restarted operations and just with priorities and uh, getting the fleet up and running and taking delivery of our new ships and a whole host of other things. We haven't been able to do it, but very excited that we are finally able to do it. Uh, we are going to be sailing on the Disney Wonder uh, beginning July 15th, and I'm trying to pull up my calendar right now to see what day we will be in Ketchikan, but we will July be visiting. 17th. July 17th, we'll be in Ketchikan. Awesome. Thank you, Beth. So July 17th, 
Uh, we're going to have two industrial engineers, and they're just going to be there really to observe. Um, but Lori has been an amazing partner because she has created this share site and loaded it with a ton of good information. Really, for us, what we want the visit to be is just one part of the process, right? We want to understand from the community, from the leaders, what are those pain points? You know, are there specific streets that are problematic? Are there specific areas that are problematic? Um, what are those pain points for you? So we can start looking at the maps, look at the layouts, look at what's going on. When the team gets there, they already have a sense of what's going on. And then they actually see the people coming off. They see how tours get dispatched. And obviously in Ketchikan, it's a bit of a unique situation because the docks aren't all right next to each other. So you have one and two and then three and four. So um, any information that you can provide is gonna be immensely helpful. I'm actually gonna be setting up calls because we have been working with our team to identify who would be coming with us on this adventure because I'm gonna be there as well, uh, along with Beth and her team. So now that we've got some folks identified, we're gonna be setting up meetings, not just with Catch Game, but with all the partners who we're gonna be visiting on that sailing to just get a better understanding of what are the pain points, get a sense of what the layout is, and then we'll be there to observe. And then typically the work product, just to kind of, you know, the work product is generally kind of just a list of recommendations, right? Um, we've done this in a number of other ports around the world. And usually what the team does is just provide, hey, look, this is what we observe. We think if you add some signage here, this is gonna help move these people in this direction. We saw congestion in this area. If you move these things around, you should see a better flow going in and out. So it's really just gonna be a set of recommendations and thoughts. We try to be mindful about cost. So obviously tearing up streets and redirecting traffic, that's like at the, at the further end of the spectrum. We try to find that low hanging fruit that can easily be implemented and something that again, just doesn't benefit us and our guests. We are trying to keep the rest of our industry partners in mind, as well as the community to find something that's a win-win across the board. So I think um, one of the important aspects is for us to go through this process and really ask the experts of how we can best move people in our uh, facility, our, our town. The thing to keep in mind for the public is that there will be recommendations, but we'll also have to go through that public input process. So we're not going to be shutting down streets tomorrow and saying, yeah, well, Disney said so, or, you know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have that public vetting process. And I just want to emphasize that because when the council adopted their core values uh, last year in April, transparency, transparency, transparency. So we've been having a lot more public meetings than we did in the past. And so I just want to emphasize everything we're talking about today. There is going to be that public input and public meeting component. I would greatly appreciate avoiding anything that says Disney shut down something. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, 100%, right? It's a dialogue and it's a set of recommendations. And, and, you know, we obviously do not live in the community. And so what our team is doing is taking the information they have, observing, and then providing some thoughts on how they would see it in a vacuum. I can tell you in the time I've been here and in the ports that we have done these exercises in, there's usually some tweaking that needs to be done because no matter how well you engineer something, humans find a way to find alternative routes. So, so it's definitely an iterative process and that context from the community around sort of how things are is going to be really helpful and instrumental in sort of shaping whatever the recommendations end up being in terms of implementation. <laughs> anyway, so a couple other items. One was we, uh, we were asked by some council members to, to encourage the industry to work more partnerships with local NGOs and community groups. And actually the point, you know, as I just mentioned in terms of you know, finding out, you know, in terms of maybe there might be more groups that are working on signage and things like that. 
And I think that's uh, obviously the KBB is involved in that historic catch can other groups. And so we want to be encouraging um, the industry to find ways to work with some of those groups going forward. Um, also, to let the community know about um, grants or funding partnerships the industry might have available for various things. I think that would be probably both of those things would speak to our relationship going forward. I think it's helpful for you as community members to let us know, you know, let us know what partnerships you see are lacking. Yeah. And again, then we go back to individual member companies and determine what's possible, what the art of the possible is. But I think that all comes from that two way communication that I hope that I think we're seeking. And I do know, for example, like Robert was saying earlier, we, we have tried to put little funding ideas, and I think that's something you'll see continue. I think as we talk even about shore power and other aspects of um, of the industry, we're very fortunate. I think all Alaskans know we're very fortunate to have a, a, a delegation uh, in Washington, D.C. that fights really hard for Alaska, and I think you'll see them continue as we talk about reduction of, of um, greenhouse gas emissions and that type of thing, they will continue to fight for the things that places like Ketchikan and the rest of our state need because we are a really unique place. Um, and I think maintaining your relationship with people like Sherry Klein, who works for the two senators here, will be you know a huge part of that as well because Sherry flags things. Sherry and I used to work together and I know she's very, very passionate about her love of Ketchikan and flagging things um, that you all could benefit from. But I think again, part of that, yeah. Letting us know what what you need from us, but then absolutely we will continue to keep you aware of what we know is coming from a, a federal grant perspective or a local grant perspective. Well, the truth is, Catch Can runs on its nonprofits. You know, we have you know, I, I don't know what the number of percentages wise, but actually most states, most communities in Alaska have a huge number of services being provided by nonprofits. And if there's any way that you can work with them, and also to alert them to possible you know, opportunities, is always a good thing for everybody. Is there anything cheaper than you? Mm -hmm. um, and with that, Mr. Mayor, I think the, the big message is, and I'll pick on Jamie and Chris because they were here today, but their businesses, their local businesses are pretty much supporting, and not just their <laughs> businesses, but their local businesses, um, along with uh, even the, the mayor's wife. We have all these local business owners who are incredibly generous and incredibly involved in contributing to the youth and the nonprofits of our community. So you'll see Parnassus and Tongas and Captain's Lady, you'll see their, their logo pretty much on every sporting jersey event, banner, uh, discount card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have several businesses that have that sort of investment in our community. And so one of the questions that came up is, how do you demonstrate these huge corporations who really do have a big impact as businesses in our community showing that support, that same level of support in catch can. And, you know, it could be as easy as a $500 sponsorship to the softball team or, you know, um, how do we engage that way? Because we have these local, and I'm not saying that you have that obligation to our community, but really that's, I'll be honest, and I'm totally speaking out of turn, but I love in catch can that we get that sort of small business support. I've never seen that in any community I've lived in where the, the small businesses are really showing their support of the community as a whole. And they're very, very active and incredibly generous. And so we're seeing that from our small business owners and yes to the residents, but the question is how do we also make that partnership with these large impactful corporations who, who do come to town and you are a big presence. I'm sorry. <laughs> Turn this on. I think one one thought or idea might be to pull some of our uh, community relation type folks into that conversation. Um, part of it's to understanding, you know, being a big global company, what our pillars for giving are. So, you know, there's there each company, each business is going to have some kind of priority set. So for us, it's around education. It's around marine conservation. So when you have a nonprofit that really focuses in on certain areas that match up with our pillars, it's a lot easier for for our, you know, certain parts of our business to say, yes, um, that makes sense. And so. Um, I'm not going to just voluntold or voluntell Helen, but we have a person on our team who looks at some of these types of things. So maybe we can form a meeting down the line virtually with the right players just to have a conversation around that, if that's helpful. Thank you. I'll uh, pop in here and, um, you know, Catch Again is a unique community when it comes to the arts and, and the nonprofits and every arena. And I don't think that, you know, it, it, 
um, doesn't go without saying that um, one of the main reasons people like coming here is the fact that we have one of the largest arts communities in the state. And that's what people and half our businesses host local artists. Um, I think that I would like to see where the industry actually puts um, a fund, funding mechanism that goes into a coffer that can be distributed where it doesn't require the nonprofits to attempt to find the funding. And I think 500 is, uh, I've heard this said um, over the years, not recently, but over the years it's, why haven't um, you applied for some of the fundings that the uh, cruise industry offers? Well, because the paperwork wasn't worth the money. The time put into the paper was not worth the money they were offering. So I think, um, you know, we have um, the, the Main Street Gallery, we have the, the um, uh, First City Players, we have, um, we have multiple, like, women's coalition that deals with mental health and all, all varieties of um, areas that are beneficial, that make this community vibrant. And um, without them, this community would not be what it is today. And I think it's important that when we talk about this, it should be, you know, like we have a hospital, our hospital um, lease that we need, we require them to put so much money into those, uh, into the community and back into the community and, um, and into the nonprofits. So I think that would be where I'd like to see that go. So circling back a little bit, um, oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I, I can't. I, actually, I couldn't see your name. It's it was, it was not actually aimed so I could see the name of anybody else. The mayor has to be able to see it to recognize you. Well, hello. Now I can. So I guess um, I'll keep my comments pretty short. I personally have seen um, the industry participate in. Um, a lot of sponsorships. Um, I was a recipient of a, a cruise that was auctioned off uh, for one of the nonprofits. So I do appreciate that. Um, I think that as far as that goes, we see you everywhere. What I want to know now, though, is what's next? So we've talked about this. We've had this meeting. I've been on the city council. I took a year off last year. But for 10 years, we've been talking about all this stuff. So what do we do next? How do we get an agreement like Juno has? What's the next step? Who do we have to meet with? Who's got to be at the table? How do we make that happen? That's the, you know, that's, that's the question. What is the next step from your perspective? I, I would like to see some sort of agreement in place before next summer. Before Absolutely. So I think we agree. So exactly. As council members and you said, how does that happen? Whose attorneys meet with who? Who comes up with a framework? Where do we go? So I think it's important to remember that the, the, the agreement that we have with Juno came out of, you know, a contentious situation. Trust. Um, Thank you. Exactly. And so I don't, I don't necessarily know that we need to have lawyers involved. I think from our perspective, from, from CLIA's perspective and our member line's perspective, and I'm sure they will all uh, jump in at some point, but um, we can set a framework talking with each other, whether that's Delilah and, and CLIA and, you know, getting feedback from you, getting feedback from our member lines, put something to paper and, and get it before the council. But I think the goal is, Okay, if we want to do it similar to Juno, then we, you know, we receive a list of projects from all of you that are your wish list. And we, as we are doing um, in Juno, we will either say, you know, green, green, red, yellow, you know, caution. Ultimately, like, you, we're telling you what our, what, what our thoughts are. You can go ahead and, and, and move forward on any project, but we're telling you like that one is not even in the gray area. That's in the, in the maybe no-go area. You know, you have that conversation, you have that dialogue. Um, and I think it's part of the larger conversation. You're also going to see, you know, we do have a good situation in Juno. We do work that process quite, quite well. 
you're going to see these conversations take place across the state. We are wanting to make sure that every community has something in place with us so that we do have a, you know, by October 1st, the city of Ketchikan will have us their wish list. By December 1st, we will have responded to said wish list. And if that means we all come together and have something like this, then, you know, what do you want? What do we want? And I think we can work together and put something, put a framework in place. Does it have to be, I understand how Jules operates, but does it have to be a, a, a project specific or can it be more general than that? Because I guess the question is, I'm not doing that through the process on both our sides, having to disagree or argue over a specific project, or we just want to be able to say, okay, this type of project's okay, this type of project's not okay, here's the goal. I, mean, I, I'm, I'm I think we can, I think that's up to us as the two parties involved yeah. to decide. We don't have to have the exact model of Juno has, but we have to have a model. It, exactly. I think that's absolutely true. Not every, it's not a one size fits all, I would argue, but. And Mr. Mayor, to that point, I just based on the conversations today, I'd imagine that we have some sort of document or agreement where we, and this is the notes I've been taking of what it's going to look like at the end of this discussion is that we acknowledge and affirm our own acceptance of our interpretation of the federal laws. Like, this is what we all affirm and acknowledge. This is what we believe is acceptable. Um, and to that, what is acceptable use that all parties are comfortable with that, that we commit to um, agreeing on a process for those projects, whether it be a annual process, an annual review, whatever that component is, that we include that process in an agreement that we commit to revenue requirement review as far as the parameters for developing morphage fees. That through this document, we say, yes, that is acceptable use, or that's an acceptable component of the port revenue requirement, which does translate into revenue generation and rate setting for the port. Um, that we agree on acceptable or necessary upland development to serve the port, that there may be items uh, there that are, and then, just now, maybe a possible grant component that we all agree to, and, or, you know, those are the items I have thus far of this is what that initial agreement would look like. That was next. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is the old school moving a hand up on a, a <laughs> Zoom call now. Exactly. Wish we never see the hand so small. Yeah. It used to be the size of about this big. Yeah. Right? Okay, I know I, I went up before you a little quicker. Um, but my thoughts before you started speaking, Delilah, you have really, um, really captured it quite well of exactly the path that you're going to take. And I think you structured it, you structured it correctly. And um, I have to applaud you at, from this three hour meeting coming back with those exact facts. Those were great. And I, and I think it's um, each year that you go into this as you get to know which, which um, projects are okay and which, you know, where they follow the, the red, yellow, green principles. I think you'll get smarter and smarter about what, what is not and, and not ever put forth things that are like, oh, no, that's a no go. Mm -hmm. And, um, and as you set out your plan for the next 5 years, you'll know what those funds can cover and what they can. not So. I, the comments I had were, were exactly what you said of, of how we should know about it. So, thank you. Yeah, agreed. Good job. Um, the, uh, the consideration is, uh, you've got, you know, you've got a, you've got a public, right? You've got to think about whatever your public process is. So my, my, and Delilah, I think we chatted about this before, but be really thoughtful about the process that you create and unintended consequences, because. I think if you sat down with Juno and asked them would they do the, the way they do it today, they would tell you no. And so, um, and we can, you know, we can talk about what some of those things are, but just just be thoughtful about about your public process, what the right way to do that is. Wait, wait. So the team here has pretty much summarized what I was going to say, but yeah, great summary there, Delilah. Um, I would caution against wish list, and that was what Robert's alluding to, right? Um, there are definitely parameters on here. I think everyone on both sides here understand that. So, absolutely working together, identifying those projects. There's projects today that we can all agree on, right? But it's finding out, um, just getting that process in place, and we're all happy to do that. 
So I think you're alluding also to the fact that we have to, in that agreement, commit to regular meetings, regular partnerships, um, involving the industry, even when we start to do uh, CIP planning to make sure they, there is a seat at the table that, whoa, 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 you know, we're making good investments whenever we do, we do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just take a moment to maybe share because we have this unique forum together um, that we, we haven't really previously had to somewhat outline what, it, what does exist um, in Juno today, which just at a high level, there are zo geographic zones that exist that were agreed between the city and CLIA, where within the waterfront zone, those projects directly related to ships, they don't, they're approved. They're, we're saying yes to those types of projects, right? So as far as you can say, getting permission or running it past us, that's something we've agreed to ahead of time. And then there is a, another zone further back that we want to discuss that with you. We're not saying no, but it's not a, it's not an automatic yes, we'll green light that because we want to have a discussion since it's outside of the immediate area of that. And then there's another area further back that essentially is, no, we can still talk about it, but that falls outside of the scope of the, of the purpose of those funds. So something to keep in mind, um, kind of as we go to develop this, again, catch can solution may look different than the Juno solution, um, it will, but, I think having an idea of how we want to approach this to categorize and bucket projects that allows an efficient evaluation process. Whereas we said, not coming at it from a public wish list perspective, but a very thoughtful approach to the funds are dedicated to, you know, the service of the vessel. What does that look like? It, it's cathodic protection. It's the peers, those types of discussions that we can have a lot more efficiently by categorizing those ahead of time. Um, and I would just say this is this is a great step in that process. Um, I, I would imagine, you know, in the next year, we'll have more of these meetings than, than will be required once we get this process set up. So let's make those discussions happen um, in, in a more rapid form to get to this type of agreement and alignment. And then as we go forward, it's essentially today, we meet once a year uh, to go over projects um, that are put forward by Juno. We have a dialogue about that. We come back to it. So that's something also that um, you can consider as, as the approach for catch can. Yeah, I was I mean, kind of picking up on that theme, just would maybe Delilah, you can recommend kind of an annual calendar mm -hmm. so that we can get, because I think, I think it would be good for us to meet in person when we can once a year, twice a year, we're all up here during the summer for the most part um, on different cadences, but you know, get in a room with people, relationships always get better. So that'd be my personal bias. And um, in ter terms of getting to an agreement, I think we can propose a timeline on that and we should get after it. So, um, you know, how these meetings are, everybody has a lot of good stuff in the room, you walk out and then you get consumed by all the other things in life. And um, I think we've we've stumbled into that trap before uh, here in Ketchikan, and so to avoid that, let's let's put a let's put forward a more aggressive timeline and get after it. Yeah. I think it you know just again based on the three hour meeting, our big goals are going to be this agreement, whatever it may be, um, meeting immediately to talk about operational changes related to the thrusters, um, and then shore power. Those are like the three big items. If I missed anything, let me know. Projects. Oh, <laughs> projects. Yeah, we'll we'll work on the projects. If the dock phones, this is all kind of Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm including that with the agreement. <laughs> Mr. Gas. Mr. Gas. <laughs> so just to clarify, we all agree a whale sculpture would be in the green light, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Too soon. It's actually on the dock. Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it'll be someone's green light. <laughs> okay. Yes, go ahead, please. Like I, I say, I, I, I can't see you through 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 because uh, Janelle's giant pink thing there is walking. <laughs> I'm just going to put some food for thought out there too. I think everybody's talked about a really great path forward. One thing that I might recommend um, once we get maybe into this a little bit more is is always reserving a little time for emerging issues on the agenda when we do get together. Um, I've had a lot of my colleagues say, boy, it's a lot harder now than it was uh, pre pandemic in terms of the industry and we're just seeing. So many rapid changes and things coming at us uh, that, that are being implemented in Europe that we think, you know, at some point in time are going to come our way or, or um, international type regulations that are going to have impacts into our business here in Alaska. So reserving a little time for us to do some sharing on that front as we see things coming that even if it might be 5, 10 years down the road would be really beneficial for you to hear about and understand as you're watching the same space evolve. So. Just offer that up for an idea on a future agenda. Let's go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Wendy, what are those emerging things that we need to talk about? Because I think the mayor just gave you the okay. Yes. <laughs> if there's something. Yes, I'm putting me on the spot. No, um, carbon disclosure laws are some things we're really seeing hit um, in California. I cover California um, and, and Seattle is in Canada, so up and down the West Coast, similar to, to Robert and, and Preston and Sandy, I think covers the whole globe. So, you know, when I when I talk about uh, Robert mentioned fit for 55 and, and what's happening there in terms of the requirements coming down the pike in, in the carbon space, um, you've got um, the, the shore power, we talked about that as an issue where we're seeing um, uh, the requirements here on the West Coast that are, are just going to keep climbing up the West Coast. We're, we're seeing um, a lot of marine protection type of regulations, uh, whales slow down type speeds that um, could really also impact itineraries in Alaska if you have to slow down so much and you can't make certain places on time. So those are the types of things that you know, taken in isolation may not seem like a big deal or they might seem like a really great idea. And then when we start adding it all up, how does it, you know, have that effect into Alaska? So those were, were are a few things I would mention. Um, I don't know, we've got a lot of folks from the industry here. What are some other things you guys might highlight? You're looking at me. Um, I think at some point, yeah, that's right. Um, that might be worth another session uh, briefing you all on Green Corridor. I think that's something people hear about but don't really know what, what that means. And there's a big body of work going on under that uh, effort that's pretty, well, it's about the Pacific Northwest to Alaska shipping corridor. So, webinar. Webinar. Yeah. Webinar. yeah. We can get that information out on the webinar. May 2nd, there's a webinar on the Green Corridor, and we'll make sure that you all have the invite, and um, and it's open to as many people as possible. But Renee or, or Lainey, if you could get, yep. you get that information out, that'd yep. be great. That's a good one. And um, uh, what was referenced in terms of speeds, I mean, that's, that's the most pertinent thing to catch, Ken. You've probably seen the port calls get shorter here, and that's a result of you know, our need to decarbonize and, and well speed restrictions. And on the flip side, it's in Victoria, we have very late arrivals and very short port calls there as well. And um, I don't think sometimes all those dots are connected and people, why, why do the ships all come in at the same time? Or why do they do, why do they leave at one, two in the afternoon, one in the afternoon? And I think we can probably help provide some more um, color behind why those things are the way they are. and. Uh, would be maybe useful to the broader community and other stakeholders here. Yeah, I think those are those are good ones. Um, that's just happening here in 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 our own backyard. And then I'm just going to uh, add to what Wendy said. In Europe, really, what's being talked about not only in California are the package rules, but it's more important. Uh, it's getting more important in the EU in general is to start measuring our scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, and they're going to start. Um, and, and not only do we have to measure it, but we have to provide it to anybody that takes a cruise. So a travel agency will know what their scope one, scope two, scope three. And the problem is that it, it took years, I think, for the airline industry to figure out what their scope emissions was across all of the different organizations. Because 
for as many cruise lines as we have. I'm going to just pick on Robert that maybe two of your cruise lines don't even want to measure it the same way between themselves. I mean, it's just, it's just uh, such a dialogue. And um, the next thing is fuels. What is the future fuel? That is just such. And who's going to produce it when nobody will know what it, you know, nobody is ordering it yet. Who's going to, what's going to go forward? It's battery storage. It's all, all of these things and how deep we go into the supply chain to, uh, to, to, uh, to do emissions and just uh, getting enough. But what we see, you know, unfortunately is that every, um, every uh, session that we have for parliament, the decisions aren't made and then they're punted to the next year. And now we have a new, uh, we have a new parliamentary commission um, for next year and they're starting kind of on a playing field that they probably started on a year ago because these discussions are so complex. And so that's really, really one of the key issues. Maybe one more throw in the room, which is maybe obvious, but we haven't even really talked about it, but there is this anti cruise movement going global and we've seen it play out a bit here in Alaska. And as an Alaskan who lives in this state and has seen a lot of changes to the industries that used to fund our government and our economy, and how that is shifted. And now I'm even concerned about the fishing industry and some of the stresses we're seeing there. And I, I see tourism and I see that bright spot of an industry that's growing and, and doing a lot of good things. It's creating some stresses in the system, but I don't think we can afford to make wrong decisions about um, you know, the future of, of uh, tourism in our state right now, given that so many communities, not just in Southeast, but throughout the state um, rely on it quite a bit. So. That's an emerging issue hitting us right now, and we're seeing, you know, just a lot of stuff at play. So I guess that's a, a way for me to be able to then to bring it back that having these kind of conversations where we're sitting down, we're working through some tough issues, developing some frameworks. It keeps us all talking and, and in a place where we're trying to do more of a front end proactive management as, a, as opposed to the reactive type mode that I think we can easily get into. So thank you for bringing this together. I guess we've reached the point now of attendee comments. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I have a, just a brief comment. It's, it's less a question than, than just putting something on the table, especially for the industry representatives who are here. And it was kind of sparked by something Wendy said earlier when we were talking about engagement with the community. Um, and you mentioned education. And we're, we're really lucky here to have a, a strong, robust maritime program at the University of Alaska Southeast Ketchikan campus. We also have a small but stubborn maritime program at the high school <laughs> and opportunities for students in either program to either visit your ships, talk with your crews, I think would be excellent for our community. It might be good, good job recruitment on, on your end. So if there are any opportunities to build relationships in that respect, I think it would benefit everybody. That's great for us to know. As we mentioned before, that does happen in other communities and yeah. you know, we would certainly encourage that to happen here as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And also with the arts community too, uh, if you wanted to some of your musicians to come off and maybe do something with the local musicians or do some kind of a fundraiser or something, that that would be a, a great PR. <laughs> so let's go around the table one more time, uh, Mr. Morgenstern. Final comments. <laughs> Well, not final comments. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, just thank you um, for the invitation to come in person. As I said earlier, I think we're always better when we sit, sit in the room together and uh, get to know each other better. And um, I think it's been a very productive conversation. You've all been very clear about what's on your mind and what your priorities are. Um, thank you to Delilah for uh, doing a great job of kind of proctoring this and synthesizing the uh, discussion into some action items and really look forward to um, making some progress with you. I'll forget otherwise, so I better jump to Jose and otherwise I'll totally forget through there. So I think Jose and Jose. No, just echoing Robert's statements. Thank you again for the opportunity to sit here with you guys. I mean, this is, we've been, at least for me, I think it's been really productive. Three hours and it's, you know, again, yeah, it's good to get school for three hours. Isn't it about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
No, it's it's been great, and we really appreciate it. We're looking forward to continuing the dialogue, continuing the partnership, and, and putting these uh, putting these words into action. Councilmember Flora. Thank you, Your Honor. I just want to thank everybody, especially from the industry, for taking the time to come to town and meet with us today. And looking forward to some fruitful outcomes. Renee? Yes, thank you for having us. Uh, I think, you know, we, we tend to listen to most of your meetings. We tend to listen to all the city council and uh, assembly meetings across the state. Lainey and I live really exciting evening lives. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when you, when you when we come up or you have a question, we're happy to call in. We're happy to be, you know, we want to be a resource. We want to be part of the conversation. Um, and so, when those moments arise, even if we can't get on a plane, just let us know. I think we're happy to we're happy to speak to the issues and the questions that you have anytime. So thank you. We, we just like to grumble. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in the room. It's easy to grumble about you. It's true. That's what was needed. Well, on that note, I think that speaks volumes to how we need to foster our relationship. And I'm I'm really happy that you guys took the time to come up here. Um, I've learned a lot. I think we have a lot of homework. Um, and I look forward to us moving forward. Yeah, great comments. Um, thank you so much for putting this together. I am in frequent contact with Lori and uh, really appreciate the role that you've been tasked with kind of defining as you're coming into this. It's um, a pretty heavy lift to do and uh, we've, we've had a great relationship in Juno with the tourism manager there. It's a, a needed position and it's just a really great liaison uh, between Delilah and us and, and uh, Mr. Mayor, the council here, but um, something that Wendy said, emerging issues, I would really encourage you too that, um, like Renee said, we are happy to call into a city council meeting and be there for that. But also if something comes up or you have a question or an issue that's coming up, pick up the phone and give us a call, right? And I know Lori, you really are the conduit for that, but please feel free to do that so that we don't, um, let anything fester and we keep this positive forward looking and movement going. Thank you. Thanks everyone. This has been a very positive meeting and uh, I hope everything moves forward as we all would hope or as we all will agree on anyway. I don't have anything. Just Lori, I'm be sending you a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for being here and I really appreciate that you were able to just come together and I do agree with Robert that a lot of times when you're actually in a room with someone it makes a huge difference because you can really have that communication and so thank you everybody for being here and I really look forward to positive movement forward. Well ditto this is about what I was going to say, and, and um, Sandy and Preston and I were talking about this a little bit before we got started uh, this afternoon. It's just there's such a benefit to being able to sit down together, and otherwise we seem these amorphous entities that have ideas about each other but don't have any real dialogue. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to meet in person. Thank you all. My finger doesn't work on this thing. <laughs> Um, I already said thanks. So I guess what I would I would just highlight is uh, the season is coming fast. Um, I think just in what what a couple weeks, three weeks. So Delilah, maybe um, setting a date sooner than later for us to all reconvene and and making sure we're keeping that moving forward because I know it gets really busy and it's going to happen soon. So anyway, thanks again for having us to catch again. Yeah, thanks. Uh, apparently, the fingerprint does not work on this. <laughs> um, yeah, I appreciate everyone coming out. And uh, just FYI, I'm one of those people that's going to say what I think regardless. So you'll get what I think, period. <laughs> you don't have to like it, but that's the way I am. That's how I roll. I uh, speak from my heart. I'm a sixth generation Ketchikan. I grew up in this town, it was logging and fishing, and it was uh, small businesses. I grew up in a small business, and uh, I want what's best for this community, no matter what. So, thanks for coming, guys. And, and so, 
It's every six months, right? <laughs> We're going to try. Um, I would like, although some of them have left, I would like to thank our gallery here for getting up and, and your positive and your enthusiastic words about the industry because it's you all make this work. People around this table, but you are very important to us too. So I appreciate you all coming out, spending three hours of your um, Wednesday afternoon with us and what you do for us every day to make this all work. You provide these amazing guest experiences and keep us coming here because our guests want to come here. So thank you. And I look forward to having more dialogues like this. Collaboration is key. And the more that we can do, um, the more successful we'll all be together. Yeah, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I think one takeaway for me from all this is uh, obviously we're in a bit of a hole financially and that may or may not be to um, management of the past, but I think our plan, and I think everyone here is in agreement with this, is to get to the point where we get our fees at the port through all the different fee structures at the port to a point where we aren't in this position in the future to where uh, we have the money to fund at least starting with everything port related and then go from there on the red light, green light thing. So I think uh, we want to get to that point and we, we plan to get to that point. Also, it was a bit of an educational experience for me to hear about all these plans with Europe and cruise ships that don't put off any emissions. That seems crazy to me. I don't know if they're going to put a sail or a windmill up or whatever, but I think, I, I think, uh, you know, I, we appreciate the info on that. I think one thing I wanted to mention was, you know, we are, Ketchikan is not Europe. We are sovereign Americans and we are a state that is dependent almost totally on oil. So while we keep in mind all of your guys' plans in Europe and other places, that's great, but we wanna, we wanna keep Ketchikan, Ketchikan and Americans. So uh, thank you to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I would echo what um, Sandy had said and appreciate the attendance here. I, I understand this will be televised later. So I guess to, to that audience also, um, we, we appreciate your engagement and uh, you should know that the, the council here is genuinely um, working here in a very uh, productive way to, to solve a lot of these issues. Um, so. I want to thank the council for having us, to my industry colleagues, to CLIA um, for the work that you guys have, have uh, put into this. I learned a lot today. Um, and I think one of the final thoughts for me is that I would ask Mayor Kiefer um, to, to put some, some time into is, um, you know, what does it look like to continue having a dialogue? Um, is that through uh, Delilah? is that in forums like this, I think we're open to, you know, these types of, of thoughts and opportunities. It's, we've, as we've all said, it's, it's productive, you know, we're moving ahead with this. So aside from the agreement that, you know, we will reach and we will do, um, how do we have a dialogue uh, going forward to, to talk about these issues that are very dear to, to catch can and, and to us as an industry? Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you to the to the audience who patiently sat over for three hours, and uh, thank you to all of the council members who took time and times out of their lives to be here, and thank you to all of you guys for coming. And with it, to partially answer your question, I would envision um, this being a regular sort of thing, um, even you know, irregardless of the other process of what we're talking about. I think just being, you know, as 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 was stated numerous times today, you, know, you are. The, the major local industry at this point. And that's not going to change. And we need to be open in dialogue with you guys. And I, I, I agree with the you know, so, 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 so guys up there, but I, I, I agree with you. We're, 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 screen. we're just not really, we're not really connecting. And it's too easy to model so I don't know, but I think physically being here. And plus, from a greater standpoint, the fact that you're all here says something important to the community from your industry. You know, that's that's a real important statement that you're making, but that's important to get out to the public that you guys take times out of your lives to come here, you know, at a time in the season when, to be honest, you guys got a lot of work happening too. And it's it's all ramping up and I, I, I certainly do appreciate that. 
Um, so I, I would certainly anticipate you know, uh, regular, at least once a year, maybe twice a year, skills, that we could have this sort of sort of get together to to cover cover things and also cover things that necessarily is you know it's it's good for the opportunity for us to hear from you what's coming down the pike. And it's a real good good thing too because you know we don't, you know, we, we we all read the magazines and the newspapers and the shipping list and that we we, we all we, we all go so it's almost like we need to pretend we know something that's going on out, out in the real world. But the reality is you guys are the experts. And so anything you can do to us you know before it shows up suddenly on the first step is always a good thing. And um, with that, we'll do this again. And it's good to also it's good to actually have some very specific, particularly in regards to to a long term agreement, because that's where we got to go. We need to have that in the next five, six months or whatever, and just get that get that taken care of. Thank you.